Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to the discussion on environmental monitoring for management of Legionella in water systems. In 2017, a committee was put together by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, Water Science and Technology Board to address this important topic. I was honored to chair um, this distinguished committee. I'm Joan Rose from Michigan State University. Our members were Nicholas Ashbolt, Ruth Berkelman, Bruce Gutelius, Charles Haas, Mark Le Chevalier, John Letson, Steve Pergam, Michelle Provost, Amy Pruden, Michelle Swanson, Paul Vanderwillen, and Lan Chi Weeks. We were um, uh, directed um, by Laura Ellers, our senior staff officer. Um, as you can see, this distinguished group was made up of environmental engineers, microbiologists, um, medical professionals, and public health specialists. As a result of this committee work, in, in the end of 2019, we produced a report, Management of Legionella in Water Systems, and this is available for your download. Um, it includes five chapters. Chapter one was just an introduction to uh, the, the disease and uh, what we know so far about Legionella. We've got a chapter on diagnosis and ecology, but we are going to be focusing today on the quantification of Legionnaires, uh, uh, Legionella in water system. Um, we had a, a chapter on prevention and control strategies, and of course, a measuring um, both the disease and, and the bacteria and water systems um, is uh, integral to looking at prevention and control uh, in water systems. And finally, we uh, evaluated um, regulations and guidelines on Legionella control. Chapter three focused in, as I said, on quantification of Legionella and Legionnaire's disease. Um, the committee um, estimated that there were actually anywhere from between 52,000 and 70,000 cases of Legionnaire's disease in the United States each year. And you can see that um, the, the disease was going up both in, in Europe and US, which was part of the emphasis for this uh, uh, report. Environmental monitoring was a key part of this chapter. And um, the committee looked at hundreds of papers from all over the world on monitoring of Legionella in water system and compiled that data. And finally, the committee took on a, a, a quantitative microbial risk assessment for Legionella pneumophila. Methods are evolving, of course, for quantification of Legionella. Um, the purpose uh, can be for diagnosis, outbreak investigation, routine monitoring, mitigation assessment, and research. We have many tools. Of course, there's a standard culture method, which has evolved over many years, but we have new culture methods available to us and quantitative molecular tools. This can distinguish between Legionella species, Legionella anemophila, serogroup one, and other species like Anesia. Most of the methods are quantifiable. That is, we can get concentrations. And of course, the pros and cons, the culture method takes a long time. It can underestimate the levels there because of viable non-culturable cells. And finally, PCR methods, um, while they can detect many different species, detect both live and dead. Interestingly enough, the committee was able to look at concentrations um, uh, that were monitored in water systems, a variety of water systems during routine sampling and during outbreaks. And there was a demarcation, a, a level in which um, you could uh, demark or uh, distinguish between uh, concentrations found uh, in non-outbreak situations and concentrations found in outbreaks. This 50,000 colony forming units per liter um, is a level that warrants serious concern in the committee's view. Uh, it's considered an action level. Um, this is where uh, immediate remediation should take place. Uh, obviously, no one wants to be near 
a concentration of Legionella in which there could possibly be an outbreak. The committee also looked at QMRA, I looked at um, the risk of, uh, risk of infection at 10 to the minus four uh, in um, uh, devices and fixtures, as well as a dolly, the disability um, adjusted life years, which uh, takes into the account the impact of the morbidity mortality. And you can see that these are some of the numbers um, uh, as low as 1,410 colony forming units for conventional shower at 10 to the minus four, and for the Dolly um, a conventional shower at 14 at, at one in a million risk. In chapter five, we reviewed the federal laws and regulations pertinent to Legionella, the state and local um, uh, regulations or guidelines, and what were enforceable policies. Um, most of these are guidance documents. Um, and we also evaluated where the rules and policies were, were uh, going in other countries. And finally, there were recommendations on monitoring and steps forward. Our recommendations included the expanding the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services memo to require monitoring for Legionella in environmental water samples for all hospitals. Register and monitor cooling towers, require water management plans in all public buildings, including hotels, businesses, schools, apartments, government buildings, and require temperature of 60 degrees at hot water heaters and 50 to five degrees at distal points. And finally, require minimal disinfectant residuals and monitor for Legionella throughout the public water system. Today's program has um, uh, a number of our committee members presenting. Amy Pruden will present three purposes of Legionella monitoring. We will then hold a panel to discuss how do we look at these action levels and thresholds. And finally, we will, after a break, um, have two presentations on where and when monitoring should occur. Michelle Provost, uh, Provost will uh, speak on buildings and cooling towers, and Mark Chevalier will talk about utilities and distribution systems. We will finally have questions from the audience. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward uh, to hearing from all of you. Now I'll turn that over to Amy. Okay, here we go. Well, it, it's good to be here together as a committee again and have this opportunity to consider next steps for the NASCM Legionella report. So today we're focusing on recommendations regarding monitoring of Legionella and water systems and what that might look like in practice. So my aim here is to provide kind of a big picture overview of the purpose of Legionella monitoring and implications of the methods selected. So I'm starting here with what has now become an infamous exemplar in Flint, Michigan, and how disruptions in the municipal water system and operation can and should be a red flag for Legionella. And there's an intimate connection between the water chemistry variables and the potential for disease outbreak. In the report, we identify four main purposes for testing Legionella in the water. And the first is outbreak response. So you have the unfortunate situation that an outbreak is already underway and you need to find the source and mitigate the spread. However, ideally you wanna prevent the outbreak in the first place. And here Legionella monitoring can help <clears throat> to identify red flags and where there's vulnerability for transmission. And the third would be that you've identified locations in the water system from the outbreak response or routine monitoring that are of concern. And now you're applying some sort of mitigation such as disinfectant or elevated temperature. And you need to show that this is actually causing Legionella numbers to go down. And the fourth is a general category I would call research. So here you might see a, a wider variety of methods and approaches applied 
with the aim of advancing the science and understanding how Legionella proliferates and how it can be controlled. So key motivation for action here, and this was emphasized in the report, is that the Safe Drinking Water Act does not provide protection from Legionella. At best, municipal water utilities are legally required to provide a target disinfectant residual to the property line, and there's no requirement for Legionella monitoring. Also, the target disinfectant residuals were not really selected with Legionella in mind. And a key barrier is that, except for the lead and copper rule, regulations stop at the property line. And it's within the premise plumbing where conditions are especially conducive to Legionella growth. You have high surface area to volume ratio, which encourages biofilm formation, warmer temperature within the growth range of Legionella, and higher water age and reactive pipe materials, which lead to disinfectant loss. I also mention here cooling towers, which efficiently serve their purpose for indoor temperature control in large buildings, but also have to be watched carefully because they inherently operate within the ideal Legionella growth temperature, and they produce aerosols that can effectively deliver Legionella to the lungs and cause infection. So here appropriate disinfection and cleaning is essential. Okay, so if we're going to monitor Legionella, what to monitor? And it's not quite that simple. For one, there's 61 known species of Legionella and a handful are known to cause disease. But Legionella pneumophila is uh, by far the most notorious and is the most widely recovered from patients associated with risk and best characterized. Still, even within Legionella pneumophila, there are 14 serogroups, and the clinical urine antigen test only captures serogroup one, while environmental testing can, in theory, capture all of the serogroups. And there's also numerous sequence types, which can be determined by whole genome sequencing or sequencing of seven specific alleles, but this is usually only done in the case of an outbreak investigation. So in a perfect world, what would we want our ideal method attributes to be? Here's the wish list. We'd want something that's specific, sensitive, quantitative, fast, high throughput, discriminant, economical, easy to use, in situ, and importantly, indicative of risk. That's that it's representative of an infectious transmissible target that is informative to risk assessment. For example, we know much more about L. pneumophila when it comes to disease transmission. So many have suggested that this should be the focus of monitoring. So what do we have in terms of methods? Culture has <clears throat> long been the gold standard with appropriate confirmation testing. It is specific and it's sensitive if you do a good job uh, guessing the dilution and, and effectively get rid of background organisms, which is really hard with cooling tower water, then it's quantitative. Uh, most importantly, it's the only approach that's going to exclusively be discriminant and report on live organisms. Though by definition, it, it's going to miss viable but non-culturable or VBNC. And the main drawback to culture is that it is slow. At a, at a minimum, it's going to take three to seven days for results which can be problematic in urgent situations. So suitable applications, absolutely in an outbreak response, it's going to be the only way to identify the source strain by comparing to clinical strains. It's also the only way to verify for sure that any mitigation is actually killing the Legionella. In recent years, qPCR has been emerging as an alternative DNA-based technique that can be appropriate in some situations. So qPCR is highly specific and you can zoom in on your target of interest, be it pneumophila, serogroup one, whatever, it's, it's very fast. And if all goes well, you'll have results in less than a day. It has similar se sensitivity to culture, very wide quantitative range, and it's ideal <clears throat> if high throughput is the goal. But it's Achilles heel is that 
it can't directly distinguish living Legionella from dead or VBNC Legionella. <clears throat> its suitable application, therefore, would really be as a rapid screen for culturing or for really broad monitoring of multiple sites to be able to identify any anomalies. And although it can't directly verify Legionella is killed, you can couple it with culture and show that a mitigation is working and numbers of Legionella are going down in the long term. In terms of culture methods, the gold standard is currently the ISO method on uh, BYCE medium. Again, this is going to take three to seven days for growth. Plus you have to do confirmation, which will be another three to seven days by culture, but there's quicker methods now like uh, MALDI and PCR. The culture method tends to be biased towards pneumophila, but you're gonna pick up other Legionella species <clears throat> as well. And as I mentioned, a key point is that isolates can be obtained for outbreak investigation. But there's emerging commercial methods like Lege Alert, and they're starting to gain substantial ground. The intention here is a test that's very user friendly. You don't have to send to an outside lab and, and it's high throughput. A key distinction with Lege Alert though by design is it captures only L. pneumophila which in theory is more informative target for risk. <clears throat> and research is underway with this method, for example, looking at what grows in the wells with uh, different water types. PCR methods are also gaining ground. Um, for example, the report highlights how it was used for rapid screening of cooling towers in New York following the Bronx outbreaks, which were then followed up with culture. QPCR is advantageous because it has a very wide range of quantitation. Um, there's this droplet digital QPCR, which is a new variant that's improving sensitivity even further. And PCR and QPCR are also advantageous because of their specificity. You can choose exactly which target you're interested in, whether it's Legionella species at the genus level, or L. pneumophila, or even Sarah group one, there's primers available. I also wanted to point out that the Water Research Foundation has been highly active on this front, and they have an ongoing project looking at optimizing qPCR monitoring for Legionella and premise plumbing. And there's also a new infield qPCR unit coming online, which are intended to make the method even more rapid and user-friendly. Okay, so let's say we've chosen our method and our target. Um, as, as Joan talked about, what, what's our reasonable action level? And so this is a um, from the report, you know, ideally this target should be risk-based, but that's not always so easy to discern from building to building. So one thing the report laid out was, okay, what, what were the concentrations of Legionella reported in the literature associated with routine sampling versus excess cases versus outbreak? And here's where the 50,000 CFU per liter really jumped out as a threshold of imminent outbreak concern. But this is a really high number and it's better not to live dangerously. So, the suitable action level is, let's say, you know, probably somewhere lower than 50,000, but greater than zero. And in the EU recently, they went with 1,000 CFU per liter. But it's important to consider that this ideal number might differ from facility to facility. And this, uh, for this reason, a monitoring plan that captures the building's baseline can be very valuable for identifying concerns. And we also need to remind ourselves that if we're truly interested in preventing Legionnaires disease, most of it is not outbreak associated, but sporadic. So an important question is, what can we do to better understand and prevent these sporadic cases? One idea might be a national survey of some sorts to help better inform monitoring and regulatory requirements in the future. Now, if we were to do municipal distribution system monitoring, what might that look like? A big challenge here is that Legionella really doesn't tend to grow that well in distribution systems as it does in premise plumbing. So widespread Legionella testing could be very costly and, and 
probably wouldn't reveal much. So we know from Flint and now uh, from Quincy, Illinois as another example, that disruption to the municipal water treatment and operation can be a key contributing factor to outbreak. So one fruitful way forward might be to focus monitoring around such disruptions as lapses in corrosion control, storms, water main breaks, and construction events. And such events, if they're reportable to um, risk high risk facilities and the public for anyone who is uh, an at-risk individual, then you can uh, upscale the monitoring or take precautions. Additionally, municipal water system monitoring could be centered around high risk portions of the distribution system known to have high water age and be prone to low disinfectant residuals. So perhaps analogous to the lead and copper rule. And I would note that the Water Research Foundation also has an ongoing project looking into developing strategies for water distribution system monitoring and that'll be worth paying attention to. And I know Mark Le Chevalier has more to add to this as well. So where do we monitor and premise plumbing? I'm going to leave that to Michelle Prevost uh, later on to enlighten us. Uh, but for now to make the point that it's complex, every building is different and it's no easy task to identify and capture and monitor all the relevant risk points in one go. But then it's important to consider what we do with the numbers. Do we pick a firm threshold like 1,000 CFU per liter? As, as Joan mentioned, that was a QMRA derived goal for faucets developed from the report. Um, and it's also the EU directive threshold. Or do we recognize that every building is different and that the ideal level might be higher or lower in some buildings and locations? and depending on the resident populations and kind of a knowing our building and getting a finger on the pulse and working to control numbers to the extent possible and mitigating when there's an anomaly. So here's an example of how qPCR might be applied to verify that a mitigation is working. So in this lab scale water plumbing study, William Rhodes operated one system in the ideal temperature range for Legionella growth and showed uh, l pneumophila gene copy numbers increasing with time, especially in taps with low water use frequency. In the experimental system, he then increased the temperature incrementally, and you could see l pneumophila gene copy numbers decreasing, especially at the more frequently flushed taps. And this is just an example to show that even qPCR, uh, it can't directly tell the difference between live and dead cells, but with time can indicate that a mitigation is working. And the quantitative and high throughput nature of qPCR makes it useful there for this type of a screen and if necessary can be followed up and targeted by culture. One more dimension that cuts across all of this is whether to sample the biofilm or the water. And we know that this is where the action is. It's the biofilm as far as Legionella growth and it participates there in a complex ecology of microorganisms and replicates in free living amoebae. But for routine monitoring, it's not likely practical to access and it's difficult to standardize and make use of the numbers. And for this reason, water is really the more relevant medium to sample for routine monitoring. But biofilm can be really valuable to sample in an outbreak situation or for research. And just a brief mention of some of the relevant recommendations from the report. I mean, the first two being part of why we're all here, the recommendations to require monitoring in hospitals and cooling towers, but also to think about broader monitoring to better understand the true scope of the Legionella problem in the clinic and across the US and for sporadic cases and their linkages to water. And as far as methods are concerned, there were some recommendations to further benchmark and test the methods that I talked about here in this presentation, and also adaptations of qPCR that can better discriminate viable strains. There were also recommendations um, for grounding any standards and targets in microbial risk assessment, including such questions as how to incorporate qPCR-based measurements. 
And finally, putting it all in context, Legionella numbers should not be considered in a vacuum. Again, here's where knowing our system and all the factors that could be contributing to growth, especially disinfectants, temperature, hydraulic factors, and as I emphasize today, overall system disruptions and potential for exposure is really critical. So in summary, environmental monitoring of Legionella is key to identifying problems, verifying system controls and mitigations are working and preventing the spread of Legionnaires to uh, disease. As we move into our panel discussion, <clears throat> we need to think about what our framework for environmental monitoring should look like. What to monitor, where to monitor, frequency of monitoring, action levels, and how to implement. And I, I apologize if I've raised more questions than answers, but I'm hopeful that further questions from all of you and the panel discussion can help us to sort all of this out. Thank you so much, Amy. That was terrific um, overview. Um, and it sets the stage for this next part of the um, uh, discussion today. And I should mention that um, uh, this is uh, an, a discussion. There will not be any report or product, but this um, presentation will be available online and we'll mention that um, uh, again, where you can locate that presentation at the end. So let's move into the panel. We've got uh, Paul Wondervillen, um, we've got uh, Chuck Haas and Mark Le Chevalier. Um, and we've got a series of questions that kind of Amy led us into that we're going to start with. So we'll put that set of questions up. All right. Let's see here. So it's the view. Um, Eric, hopefully the view is in the the in center stage. Paul, do you see the set of questions in center of the screen? Not in the center. All right, very good. I must just have mine not in the right view. We've got four questions we're going to pose. Um, should numbers be based on Legionella anemophila or Legionella species? So at the genus level or other species included. What analytical methods should be used? If molecular methods are used, how would the, the action levels or thresholds be recalculated? And how do we refine the numbers depending on the type of building, water device or exposure route? So let's start with this first question. Should numbers be based on Legionella anemophila or Legionella species? Paul, why don't you start off and uh, give us your a sense of this? Okay, that's, uh, that's fine. Thanks, uh, Joe. Um, well, I must say also in the committee, there was a lot of debate on this uh, issue. Should we uh, monitor for anemophila or for Legionella species? I think there are two important aspects to this question. And that is, if we say we focus on Legionella pneumophila, does that mean that we will miss a lot of other Legionella infections uh, that are occurring? And the second one is maybe Legionella species monitoring is a very good indicator for Legionella pneumophila. Well, if you go into the first of these two uh, aspects, so will we miss a lot of Legionella infections when we focus uh, monitoring on Legionella pneumophila? It's good to know that. In most countries, it's seen that more than 95% of the Legionella cases that are reported are caused by Legionella pneumophila. Um, but that also has to do with the fact that in a lot of hospitals around uh, the world, people use the urine antigen test 
to see if somebody is infected with Legionella and that test only detects Legionella pomophila. So we still might miss a lot of other Legionella species infections due to that. But there are some countries where they also monitor by cultivating. For instance, in Denmark, if a patient which they suspect to be uh, infected by Legionella, they also try to cultivate. And also in those countries, we see that more than 90% of the cases are caused by Legionella plumophila. Um, and I also think that the research that has gone into the virulence factors of these species also show that Legionella plumophila seem to be more virulent than uh, other, most other Legionella species. So if you look into the signs of this, you, know, you, you could say that uh, uh, Legionella uh, pneumophila is for, is for sure a problem because a lot of people uh, that are uh, uh, going to the hospital with this kind of infections are, are detected as having Legionella pneumophila. Um, for the other Legionella species, we are not so sure. So, so there are some indications that that might be less, but yeah, maybe we miss them. Um, but still, I think that we should focus our focus on those uh, pathogens that we for sure know that they cause problems. And th in this case, it's Legionella uh, plumophila. So in my opinion, it's good to start focuses to start focus on Legionella plumophila uh, monitoring and not so much on Legionella species uh, monitoring. And I think it's already a challenge to get Legionella plumophila under control. And once we have done that, we can decide to start looking for other Legionella species that might cause disease or even other opportunistic pathogens that can be present in a premise plumbing. Because I think that Mycobacterium avium or Pseudomonas aeruginosa might even be more important than some of the other Legionella species. Yes. Chuck, um, what are your thoughts about this monitoring from your perspective? Well, I think the key is to be able to monitor uh, frequently and cost effectively. And if a Legionella species methodology facilitates that rather than looking at Legionella nemophila, um, I think uh, one shouldn't turn down their noses at that. I certainly agree with Paul that, you know, the Legionella nemophila is what we know now to dominate the health effects, but we need to temper that with the fact that many uh, clinical cases of, of pneumonia are not, the etiology is not really known. And so that represents a great uncertainty. But the key is really monitor um, vulnerable sites with relatively reasonable frequency. Yeah. And Mark, from the water utility side, are they interested in some of these other species? I mean, uh, there, there's 61 and we know of at least six or seven have been associated with disease. Well, I, I, I think the question here is, of course, where are you monitoring? Um, in clinical settings, uh, we're, um, that's where these other uh, Legionella species have been largely associated with, with, with illness. So you have in uh, ICUs under cancer chemotherapy, organ transplants where they're immunocompromised, virtually all of these other Legionella species have been associated with infections in that kind of environment. So now you're talking about, well, is it, is it appropriate to have a target for uh, a distribution system or uh, you know, a, a building or you know, school where, where um, you're outside of this highly immunocompromised uh, a setting? So I, I think I would certainly favor hospitals and, and nursing home places where, you know, clinical environments where we have immunocompromised, uh, high population immunocompromised individuals to, uh, to do monitoring for all Legionella. As Amy pointed out, um, more than half have never been associated with, with, uh, with illness. So, you know, that we're casting a broad, broad net. And as Paul had pointed out, many studies in Europe and, you know, around the world uh, Legionella pneumophila is predominantly the, uh, the target organism. So I think yeah. it's appropriate for distribution systems and buildings to, to, to focus on the highest priority would be pneumophila. And now that opens, as Amy pointed out, a lot of um, commercial methods, simple methods that are rapid and more, more usable than, than the, you know, the ISO, the standard culture method, which 
in theory, detects all Legionella, but in fact, um, studies have shown uh, it, I mean, it was designed predominantly for Legionella mophila. And you know, Mark, that, that really leads us into this second question, um, which is, you know, actually, uh, if we can put that up on the screen, um, uh, what analytical method really should be used, right? Because we've got some that are species specific and some that are genus. So maybe you could uh, address that a bit and then we'll, we'll get to our other panelists on this question. Sure, I, what I was saying is that the culture method, you know, people think it detects all Legionella, but in fact, studies have shown it, it's predominantly focused for Legionella mophila and these other species, it, it recovers at, at, at variable rates particularly when you add often a pretreatment, which is an acid or heat treatment. Uh, again, that was designed primarily for nemophila and, and you start losing these other species. So it's amazing that there's relatively little work in this area, but um, you know, certainly the culture method now doesn't detect all Legionella species. If you were really wanting to do that, then a qPCR uh, approach has, has been done. Uh, we published a paper a couple of years ago looking at this in reclaimed water, and by qPCR we found all kinds of Legionella species, but the culture was 95% of the uh, Legionella we got from culture was Legionella nemophila. So there, this methods certainly give you a bias of what kind of organism you're going to find. Yeah, that's right. Paul, what are they doing in Europe in terms of methods and methods development or application of different methods? Um, well, I think in Europe it's it's more or less similar as in the U.S. So, but in in the countries that have their regulations, uh, with uh, where Legionella is uh, one of the parameters, in I think all European countries it it is obligatory to do cultivation methods according to ISO. So that's okay. uh, mainly used, but that has a big drawback in my opinion, um, and that is that it has quite some time to results. It takes seven days to get a result. And of course, if you have Legionella pneumophila in your system, you want to act much faster. So there is a lot of debate going also on in the Netherlands, if uh, in, not only in the Netherlands, because that's the country where, where I live, but also in other European countries, whether or not to include qPCR as a method. Um, as Amy already uh, explained, one, one of the drawbacks with qPCR is, is the problem with, with life and death. So maybe your system was uh, colonized by Legionella pneumophila, but you used some kind of control measure and they were all killed uh, and maybe the qPCR is still positive. And you won't see that with cultivation. But I still think that qPCR can be maybe uh, a first uh, uh, method in monitoring to see if your system is negative. Because if your qPCR is negative, you know everything is fine. And then if you start your uh, qPCR uh, monitoring and you find Legionella or Legionella pneumophila, you know something might be wrong and you can start cultivation to see if, if the bacteria are also alive. So I think this, this, this is a nice strategy where you can combine methods uh, um, for monitoring, but you don't have to do all the cultivation for all, for all the samples you are taking, because most samples in, in Europe are always negative for Legionella, luckily, if you use cultivation. Yeah. So it's sort of a, an adaptive monitoring type approach. Um, and, and are they um, implementing that, uh, starting with qPCR now, and then um, depending on the number that comes out of the PCR you know, assessment, uh, moving to culture, or do they, they go ahead and send it off for culture immediately? So that it's it's not in the regulations, but a lot mm. but a lot of uh, uh, companies who have large cooling towers or also wastewater uh, um, treatment plants, which we have seen in the Netherlands, can also be a cause for Legionella outbreaks. Those companies they uh, include uh, qPCR as well as uh, as their, their normal monitoring. You have to do according to the regulations, just yeah. to to have more. Uh, more often sample uh, screening and also to get a, a quick result from that. Yeah, yeah. So um, Mark, in, in the water utility, are they, are they um, thinking about these kinds of strategies? Are they looking to Europe? Um, well, I... Uh-oh. We lost Mark. Chuck. <laughs> 
why don't you, um, <laughs> from yeah, your perspective, uh, yeah, you know, we're talking about, uh, sorry, Mark, you froze for a moment there and I just switched over to, to, to Chuck. <laughs> so we'll come back to you. Um, Chuck, go ahead. Um, you know, we're talking about trying to take research and new methods and put them into practice, really. Well, I think there's, there's a barrier um, in terms of incorporating research into practice that exists, you know, well beyond simply the Legionella uh, consideration, and that is liability. You know, if somebody uses any sort of method to monitor any sample where there could be human or ecological exposure, and you do see a hit, then what does that really mean in terms of your liability to uh, remediate or mitigate? And so that's a universal concern that we are up against. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, Chuck, or Mark, let's get back to you. I think you're, you're live <laughs> again. I mentioned there's certainly roles uh, in utilities would do operational monitoring to validate the, the, the real-time operations. And then it might right. do other types of monitoring to validate the controls. And so I can and see- And would they use different methods you think for that? So certainly, I mean, um, you know, utilities might be monitoring particle counts, for example, to measure, you know, a performance of filters, but the regulatory measurement is turbidity, for example. So you, one might use rapid methods to get, uh, you know, a sense of operations, but a culture method, for example, to validate that everything is working, um, you know, Clearly, the time is a factor. You wouldn't, one would like to have it as soon as possible, but you know the validation simply tells us what's happening now in real time is is adequate, and you know, and I know I know what's happening in my system. To to Paul though, it says um, you know, Legionella is monitored. Uh, I mean, I re refer to a report by um, Vandercory, which found Legionella species and like 97% of buildings in the Netherlands, but only 1% was nemophila. So when you said they don't find Legionella in water systems, I presume you were talking about Legionella nemophila, which is more rare. But again, I mean, I point to a study uh, by New York City uh, presented uh, last year by PCR. They found Legionella species in nearly all of the distribution system samples they collected, but rarely uh, Legionella nemophila. So uh, I, again, I think that the, the nemophila would be appropriate monitoring for water systems and buildings, and then a more inclusive uh, monitoring for, for, for clinical and environments. Again, all of this is related to your water management plan and the levels of control that you have. And so if the controls are working and they specifically want to make sure they're working for the known pathogen, um, you know, that, that would be a starting point. And as we get better methods down the road, you know, those, that, that level of um, management can be expanded. Yeah, I always think about that, you know, these methods have to be, um, like Chuck said, easy to use because while outbreaks, you know, outbreak investigation is that we're going to move forward with, with, you know, all the tools maybe in the toolbox. Um, we, most of the cases are sporadic. So, you know, and that could be very widespread in terms of where you monitor and how often you monitor. I think cooling towers sort of have a system, but, um, you know, approach, but uh, it really seems like we're going to need all these different methods um, and, and gain some experience in different systems on, on what they what they illuminate in terms of Legionella genus, the genus and, and also the species. So the concern is that in some places where there starts to be mandate, like in New York State mandates hospitals and nursing homes, um, you know, for all Legionella species, that may be appropriate there, but picking that up and putting that into office buildings or water systems, you know, from a clinical setting to a non-clinical setting, it, we should give some thought of that. Is that really necessary? Does that really meet our process control needs? Yeah, I think Chuck, how we're going to build this database, especially if we want to use um, QMRA, we go on yep. to this the, the next question. Um, the, this third question, uh, how are we going to, you know, um, uh, really use these new methods, which are going to provide more, maybe more information, higher throughput, um, 
uh, yeah, you can go, we can go on to that third question If molecular methods are used. How do we develop, you know, action levels and thresholds? And how do we use this for QMRE? Well, I think first we need a, as you say, Joan, a larger database in terms of understanding what the relationship is between the molecular signals and viable culturable uh, mm -hmm. microorganisms. And, and we don't, and uh, you know, the caution that I would give and the data do need to be developed, but there's a lot of metadata that needs to be collected as well, because <clears throat> that ratio will undoubtedly depend on the conditions that the bacteria have encountered over the course of time prior to sampling and detection. So we need to record that and ascertain maybe one set of ratios are good for um, chlorinated systems, another set of ratio for chlor chloraminated systems and so forth. Yeah. Um, Paul, what about um, using these, um, you know, viable um, molecular tools to go in and investigate, um, you know, risk and, you know, places like cooling towers where there's a constant disinfectant? Uh, you mean with the viable molecular, molecular tools? Yeah, yeah. And, and can we, can we really look, take those new uh, approaches and, and look at risk. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, so I think one of the things that is, is really missing in, in the scientific literature on, on these molecular methods is the link between the, the numbers you get from qPCR and, and the risk of disease. Um, so the, this has been established for, for the cultivating methods, so we know that quite well. But it has not been established for, for these qPCR methods, for instance. Um, at KWR, where I work in the Netherlands, we, we have done a study where we compared the numbers of, of, of uh, bacteria uh, with, with uh, flow cytometry, with culturing, um, with those that we find with qPCR, so with the gene, gene copy numbers. And, and we yeah. saw some interesting things there. So gene copy numbers are always higher than colony forming units or, or just cells counting by uh, flow cytometry. But we also saw that that depends on the bacterial species you are looking at. So we have done E. coli and Aeromonas, and we see that for E. coli, it's like 10 to 100 times higher qPCR numbers um, than cell numbers. But for Aeromonas, it was 100 to 1,000 times higher. And we also saw that it was depending on, on the growth phase these bacteria were in. Yeah. So if they were in an expansional mm -hmm. growth phase, they had the, the, the QPCR numbers were much higher than if they were in a stationary phase. And it also means that it's, it will be very difficult to recalculate the, these, these colony forming units back to, to QPCR numbers. So I think we really need data on the relationship between QPCR numbers and uh, uh, risk of infection to, to be able to get to get to some kind of, of very reliable threshold values for QPCR numbers. So that's it, I think that's one of the the, the big challenges. For, it really for, for sounds like we need this database and just a lot of different you know, venues and systems, you know, as Amy pointed out, these different buildings are very complex. And um, we've also seen these community kind of widespread uh, impacts. Um, uh, Mark, what's, uh, what is the utility? I know uh, Amy mentioned the Water Research Foundation. How are they looking at, at these new molecular methods and, and, and thinking about risk? There are, you know, it's still, I think it was worth saying that uh, it is an, uh, an area of research to try and understand. Of course, you know, there needs to be molecular methods sometimes is more of an art than it is a science and it does vary by laboratory to laboratory. So having that kind of consistency, having, you know, results that are, that are comparable across different platforms and the rest is, is important. And then ultimately taking it out of the research laboratory and you know, packaging in a way that users in the field could use that. And Amy showed, and there is an explosion of different commercial products that are coming to market that can help in this. And I, so I think it's very exciting that these, these tools 
uh, become available. And I just would be concerned that we don't have regulations or you know requirements first that would limit the ability to use a method that is Legionella Lymophila specific and say, oh, we well, can't do that because it, it doesn't do this you know, X, Y, and Z. We need to have the methods. We need to have experience. We need to have more data. And I think empowering um, utilities and operators and building managers to be able to get this information is the only way we're going to get in a situation where we really have sufficient information to start making these kinds of decisions. Yeah. So uh, the Research Foundation is work, it has worked on a number of projects. They're working on, on some more. Uh, I participated on a project, particularly around communicating these results. It's another, you know, there's a certain fear to do this testing because we don't have any framework to put this, these results in. So there's a lots of different you know, facets to this question of monitoring and, and what do I do and how do I respond. Um, that, that I think people in the field are crying for direction. So, so the, you know, the researchers, the, um, you know, the regulators uh, need to step up and provide that kind of information because I think there's a desire to do the right thing. You know, it's not the, it's not the first time we've had <clears throat> pathogens in water where we you know, had to use methodologies that did not give us viability. Cryptosporidium is mm -hmm. a good example. And we really focused in on, on treatment performance. Noroviruses is another one. Uh, Chuck, I was wondering whether uh, as there are going to be approaches where we could do use culture plus PCR in a dose response experiment with animals as was done for, um, you know, to a certain extent for, uh, for norovirus. I mean, we have an animal model which resulted in a dose response for QMRA, right? So, well, and there, there have been animal possible? models animal models for Legionella. Um, <clears throat> you know, I guess my inclination rather than repeating dose response um, studies directly with qPCR, which I think Paul was implying, was, was to look at, at, at ratios in environmental samples that we're concerned mm. with, and then use that ratio to anchor the dose response to um, an imputed environmental consequence concentration of infectious viable organisms. Yeah, I think that'd be quite interesting. I know that um, I've seen some recent data that the species by qPCR are maybe 1% or 0.1% of the, you know, the genus PCR numbers. And then you could add the culture in there as well. But you have the, I suppose, the issue of um, these other species maybe not growing as efficiently on our culture systems in our culture systems. So a lot of work to do, I think, to, to make sense of that. Let's go on to this uh, last uh, question. And um, this really, I think we're trying to get at, you know, we're gonna go into different buildings, I think. Maybe um, Mark, you already, uh, you know, kind of mentioned this. Uh, if you're talking about a hospital or a nursing home versus, you know, a residential or a business office, you know, there might be um, different numbers. And how are we going to get at that? Or even at the device itself versus the building water quality versus at the tap or various devices that might produce these aer aerosols or, or diminish the aerosols? So I think, you know, we've, we've come to two different kinds of questions. What is the health risk? Um, of you know, different concentrations and the exposure and the route of exposure uh, is, is certainly an important area. The, the second part can be related but doesn't have to fall into the same level of scrutiny is saying, well, what's practical in, on a management scale? You know, I may not know exactly whether or not exactly what the risk scale is for different concentration, but I do know that I can manage these concentrations, these occurrences at, at different levels. And, and while I'd like to know the health impacts of that, um, you know, I, I can be informed by some QMRA um, you know, analysis, but you know, whatever I do to manage the concentration, I, I know I'm, I'm moving in the right direction to, you know, to, to manage health. And so you know, we, we can move this out of a public health question into just simply a process control and process management. Right. And, and, and I do think that we have international guidelines and, and, and experience for what works in the field 
to um, you know to start the move in this this area. And uh, and I think it's really important just to get us out of the starting blocks that we have some kind of guidelines around around management to be informed by public health, but you know provide some uh, guidance to managers in buildings and water systems. Um, you know that they would know that you know. I thought like our 50,000 is certainly problematic, you know, other mm -hmm. levels could be said to say, well, you're starting to lose control. You know, we're not sure at exactly what that risk is, but you can do better. You, you know, properly managed systems generally can do X, Y, and Z. And I think that kind of guidance would be really helpful. And, yeah, and I started to work on that for water systems. I'll talk about that um, when we come back after our break. Yeah, not, but uh, Chuck, maybe you can address this because when you think about <clears throat> the numbers that came out of the, the, the risk assessment for like showers versus taps, you know, these different, you know, they produce different aerosols, different kinds of risks. But in, in, in essence, you're going to be remediating probably a building, I would guess, or a cooling tower. You're not going to remediate at the individual tap. Right. So, how? Uh, how are we going to reconcile these? Because they're, the, the numbers are pretty far apart. And we so, understand that, I mean, scientifically, because, you know, the amount of aerosols being produced. But I, I mean, what, you know, one thing <coughs> that we might start thinking about in the microbial risk world, which we haven't really done before, is to borrow a tool that they use in chemical risk assessment. And that is talk about attributable fraction. So, you know, what attributable fraction of the allowable risk um, is appropriate to say might come from cooling tower exposure, from showering, from miscellaneous aerosol devices in the household, from uh, building architectural features, to name a few, and then use the QMRA approach with the allocation of whatever an acceptable risk level is, whether it's one in 10,000 per year, one micro dolly or what have you, um, allocate that risk amongst the various sources. And then you can get down to a criteria based on the type of exposure. Yeah, and, and, and Paul, this leads me to this kind of um, question, and I know it was brought up in the report as well, is, is the issue of aerosolization and the number you know, that we actually get exposed to an aerosol versus what's in the water column, what's in the biofilm, what's in the amoeba, I mean, um, is there some way we're going to look at these different numbers ultimately for for remediation? And and are we going to start looking at remediation of amoeba as well? Is that going to potentially help us? Um, so uh, yeah, that, that are good points to uh, to raise. I think um, um, especially monitoring what is in the air results is, is still. Um, not done very much. So actually, it, there is not much data on how much Legionella plumophila will be in, in aerosols. Um, there is there is some work done on, on showers, but um, if you talk about cooling towers or, or wastewater treatment plants, that, that's for sure not been done very well. There is some modeling, but not real measurements. So actually, we don't know very well what kind of uh, bacteria that are in the water or in the biofilm will get into the aerosols and cause the problems. And for instance, in the Netherlands, that, that, that is a big issue at the moment. Uh, I explained before that wastewater treatment plants are now uh, being seen as a source of, of, of Legionella plumophila. And that's especially true for processes that run at higher temperatures because Legionella plumophila need higher temperatures to grow. Um, but these processes in the, in the wastewater treatment plants need to run at these higher temperatures for the other bacteria to move the bad stuff from, from, the, uh, from the wastewaters. And the only way at the moment to, to control these, uh, these uh, wastewater treatment plants is to cover it by a tent or, or, or by a building or whatever. Uh, so these, these uh, wastewater treatment plant owners are now saying, yeah, but we don't have to know what's in the wastewater, we have to know what's in the aerosols coming out of our systems. Because that's the true problem. So I can say that within the next few years, there probably will be a lot of data coming from the Netherlands on this because it's a hot issue and there's a lot of money going into there. And I think we really need that data 
to know more about this uh, way how the bacteria goes from the from the biofilm into the water and into the aerosols in the end. So again, big challenge for science, but I don't think we are really there. Uh, you might have seen that that in Europe we have threshold values uh, uh, defined in our regulations and also in the EU in the new EU directive that will be probably uh, be accepted somewhere in the beginning of next year. But those threshold values are not really related to risks, but they are really kind of arbitrary chosen. Um, that seems to work quite well in legislation, as we have done for a lot of other things as well. I mean, E. coli, one in 100 milliliters, is also uh, not really related to risk, but was arbitrarily cho chosen. And so I think for now, we are really into that area that we cannot really name a number that is reliable for a threshold value related to risk. So 50,000, as we have mentioned in our report, for sure for the outbreaks, but many of the cases are community acquired and we need to be lower than that. But how low? I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think it goes to say, I mean, we've got some management strategies. We've got disinfection and adding more disinfection. Flushing has been brought up. Use of fixtures, systems, you know, bringing the temperature back up, um, you know, using special devices, um, you know, that limit aerosols or, or you know, that, that can uh, prevent exposures. You know, maybe each one of you can just end up by, um, uh, making some comments about where you think the monitoring should go from your perspective and uh, uh, just a final final comment there, um, uh, Mark. Well, we'll address this more um, in, in my um, presentation, but I think from water systems and building systems, uh, I would like to see more monitoring. I've been encouraging water utilities uh, through a number of different publications and trying to provide guidance in that regard, to start doing some monitoring, to do it voluntarily, um, really as a process control. Uh, I agree that they're monitoring their system, they're looking at chlorine residuals. And so, you know, to do this to say, I think I'm doing a pretty good job, but I'm going to test that by, you know, collecting some samples and just see what's out there. When we have done that, we have found areas with low chlorine that were stagnant, and we found relatively high Legionella levels. Once the utility knew that, they had the tools, they flushed that system, they put in an automatic flusher to bring that, uh, and once they had that awareness, they were able to properly manage. And, and I recently talked to them, in two years since you know, doing that study, they haven't detected another Legionella in the system. So that, that's a success story. You know, they did some monitoring, they learned something about their system, they made the corrective actions, and, yeah. and, and so I think we're in the stage where that would be beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll hear more from you uh, towards the end of this uh, session. Chuck, what are your final comments? Yeah, I would just add on to Mark. I think, you know, knowing your system is important. And I think we probably know enough at this point, both in utility distribution systems, as well as in um, many building plumbing systems, uh, and also cooling towers for that matter, to understand under what conditions uh, you might have heightened levels of concern and to focus your sampling efforts on understanding the concentrations in space and time when those heightened levels of concern exist. Yeah. Paul, your final comment. I'll give you the last word. Okay, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I agree with Chuck and Mark. I mean, you really need to know your system. I think that's that's the number one. If you don't know your water system in your building, there might be problems. So that's the first thing to do. And the sec second thing is, if you know the weak points in your system, start monitoring for Legionella uh, or Legionella pneumophila and see if it's a real risk. And if it's a risk, you indeed should try to, uh, to control that risk by uh, control measures. Um, 
but it, it's not only important to do this for drinking water systems, because one of the things that always strikes me if we have Legionella discussions, if that, that is there is much more attention than in these discussions for drinking water systems than for cooling tower water or for uh, wastewater systems or other systems, because these cooling towers and wastewater systems might be even more important um, in, in relation to Legionella infections and drinking water. So not only monitor your drinking water systems, but don't forget about these other sources. Also start monitoring there and how well treatment disinfection works to control these uh, problems. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic point to end on, I think, um, uh, because we do need to, it's an aquatic organism. So wherever there's water and there's aerosols produced, probably Legionella. So um, thank you very much. We're going to take a, um, a break now. We'll reconvene at 9.30 and um, we're gonna have some um, uh, two presentations at that time from Michelle Provost and Marc Le Chevalier and then we'll open up for Q&A. So um, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we'll see you back here at 9.30. Welcome back, everyone. It's nice to have a little break when you've been on <laughs> these Zoom calls as we have during this pandemic. And uh, as you know, uh, I mentioned the 9.30 Pacific Standard Time and uh, we're back here at, at 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the next session is really going to talk about where in complex systems should we monitor and why. We have uh, two excellent scientists who, uh, who have contributed so much uh, to this science and to, this, and to research in this area, who will be presenting. Um, as you can tell from the previous panel, uh, you know, this, this recommendation from the, pan, uh, from the report about uh, a national uh, surveillance um, uh, program um, it may be quite useful because not everyone can actually monitor or have the um, ability to monitor a whole variety of schools and, and different buildings. And, and it's quite complex. So we're gonna hear about that from Michelle Provost, who will be talking about um, cooling towers and large buildings. And then Marc Le Chevalier, who will be talking about water uh, systems and distributions, distribution systems. So Michelle, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Okay, everything uh, is well. Is everything shared okay? Looks good. Looks good, thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks Joan for the introduction and I'm happy to continue this discussion, interesting discussion on monitoring Legionella uh, and the two presentations that Mark and I will be uh, showing you are where and when should monitoring occur and I'll be focusing on proactive monitoring to control Legionella in building water systems. So first, the, the, the best way, the best approach to reduce risks uh, associated with Legionella is to have a water management plan or management program. A risk management plan really is, is uh, aims to prevent and control uh, Legionnaire's disease uh, associated with building, building water systems. And there are many components on the right-hand side. You can see the ASHRAE table, uh, diagram of, of a water management program. It consists of uh, analyzing the building, establishing control measures, locations, and limits, and it includes monitoring. Basically, it's embedded in this program and corrective actions as a response to the, any positive measurements. And also implementation confirmation by a designated team. Water state safety plans, which are, which are more common uh, um, internationally are, are very similar and, and, and both really want to implement the appropriate management systems to ensure that the risks are added, adequately controlled. So when you want to decide how to test across the, these very different systems, you have to acknowledge the fact that you, th there's a diversity of water systems. If you look on uh, the figure from the NASM report, you can see how different uh, a wastewater treatment plant from a um, you know, taps and showers in a building are. Uh, and you have to consider as well the objective of your monitoring. Dr. Pruden uh, went through this in detail, 
but this is really important. Today I'll be, uh, I won't be talking about outbreak investigation, but routine versus determining the need for treatment or meeting a guideline or a regulation or mitigation validation are, you know, you may use quite different tools in, 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 in pursuing these objectives. And obviously research, which is my favorite, uh, would have very many tools. So different sampling approaches, depending on the objective and the water system. So what are the drivers to monitor for Legionella in, in these systems? Well, I would say the first driver would, would be that it is considered necessary by the risk assessment of your water management plan. If you don't have one, agreement and guidance and regulation is quite clear. Prioritize facilities where control measures such as water temperature or disinfectant residual levels are not being maintained consistently within target limits throughout the building. Facilities with a history of Legionnaire's disease associated with, with their building water system or if a suspected or identified cases of LD uh, have been um, uh, identified. Uh, the facilities that serve vulnerable populations, uh, such as healthcare facilities, and within these healthcare's, the the areas or wards with highly most uh, vulnerable patients. So, how uh, to sample? Amy gave a wonderful summary of of the methods, but basically, how do you collect the sample? In terms of sample collection, uh, sample volume, holding time, and and shipping. Uh, to the lab if you're not doing it locally. Well, the first line here, and this, this table is adapted from Hirsch uh, 2020, a recent paper that summarizes these different uh, recommendations. And when you look at the collection line, you see that sometimes you recommend um, flushed samples, others recommend first, flush, first draw, no flush. So that's quite a difference. Sometimes you flush for a minute, sometimes for two, sometimes the volumes depending on the system, but also for the same system would be 125, 250 ml. Other times it's one liter and the holding and conditions and the uh, requirements for shipping also vary quite a bit. So sample volumes and sampling protocols and guidance do vary. Does it, does it matter that they vary? Well, I would make the point that it does. You can see here the impact of sample volume and filtration on the concentrations of Legionella that were measured. On the left-hand side, you can see the mean Legionella species concentration adapted from Hertz 2020. And, and uh, in orange would be first draw. In gray, uh, flush sample uh, using a direct plating. You can see second draw is lower. But on the right-hand side of that figure, uh, you can see if, if filtration is used and the volume is different, the, the values will be uh, quite different as well. So the type of sample, flush versus first draw, and the use of filters are important to consider. On the right-hand side, you can see um, profiling sampling from a recent paper from Bedar that shows uh, the concentration of thermophila as a function of how much water you flush, so first draw in up to 30 liters. And uh, for two faucets on the left hand side, the blue lines, you can see that the first concentration is much higher, especially in one case, up to two logs higher than the second, third, and, and fourth draw. Uh, in another faucet uh, uh, where temperature control was not as efficient, the, all samples were equally uh, uh, concentrated uh, for Legionella. So concentration may be higher in first draw. So what's the best approach to control for Legionella? Well, obviously test for G Legionella, Dr. Pruden and, the, and, and the, the panel just discussed, Legionella primophila versus Legionella species, what kind of uh, standard culture versus the new faster enzymatic culture methods, molecular methods. I would argue that cost response time, uh, responding to regulations and guidance and relation to risk are important things to consider. Uh, I would also argue that it is way more productive and more in line with a water management program to apply a process control approach. Uh, you can't measure everywhere. You need to understand how to control your whole system. Uh, you would define and monitor operational set points, whether they would be, for example, temperature, water heater, recirculation outlets, disinfectant residuals, especially if you have on-site treatment. And you may actually look at other indicators. I'll talk about that in, in the cooling tower section. And, and, and do consider online monitoring to have a, a real online type of understanding of how your system is operated. You can see on the right hand side these really low cost uh, temperature probes that, that can be installed 
uh, and, and can uh, you know, yield a lot of information on what happens in your system. So I'll use the information provided in chapter four of the NASM report on strategies for Legionella control. Mainly I'll, I'll look at examples on how to sample to understand whether main control strategies work and their application in different buildings and devices to determine when, where, and how to monitor these systems. So the NASM report says uh, sites with potential for growth and exposure. So basically look for Legionella, which could be counterintuitive for some building managers that don't want to multiply the positive uh, results. Actually, you need to do that. If you have limited resources, you need to concentrate on where the risk is likely to be significant and adjust how you operate your building to minimize that. And focus on buildings that serve vulnerable populations again, and focus at risk areas in the building, dead ends, low usage areas, showers that have a lot of production of uh, high production of aerosol, electronic faucet TMVs that have been shown to be at higher risk for Legionella. And look at high, at risk situation, treatment deficiencies. You lose your onsite treatment, you have lower temperatures, short and extended closures, um, the COVID, shutdowns right now that we are all living through are extreme examples of that. And commissioning startups shut down, cocooning for cooling towers or, or at risk situation. And ideally, you should decide these points within the framework of your water management program. So uh, other examples I thought were worthy of, of mentioning here that there are examples of low risk situations. HSE, which is a UK uh, regulator, uh, gives as examples small bil buildings without people at risk from Legionella where daily water usage is sufficient to turn over the entire systems or small buildings with only toilets and hand wash uh, basins may be at lower risk than uh, buildings with a lot of showers. And the CDC has a, a nice uh, summary of it could be sufficient to go for the hot water system, but there are situations where cold water samples uh, are needed as well, especially in hot climates or in situations where there might be a risk uh, due to how your cold water circulates in your building. So building water systems, I'll focus on examples in, in uh, uh, hot water systems for now. Um, they, they're quite complex. There, there's a diversity of materials submitted to varying water quality, temperature, flow conditions, corrosion, loss of residual stagnation. So how to focus in there? Well, first of all, it is often recommended or required to focus more in Europe uh, than here in, in Canada or in the US, but always uh, identifying the at-risk area and selecting a test size after monitoring for, with for example, temperature, disinfectant residuals, or area you know have low flow or intermittent stagnation. And you need to include potable sources and all uh, components uh, of your system uh, when you're thinking about uh, selecting these sites. Some general features of these uh, strategies are common, but the strategy has to be tailored to each building. And once the system performance is known, then you can determine the frequency for sampling. And again, focus on points vulnerable to Legionella growth and exposure. So when you want to know your building system, it, I'll give an, a simple example here. You need to understand how your system works. And if you do not have a water safety, uh, a water management program, you may not know that, but you need to at least have a simplified view of that. And uh, to understand, for example, uh, what uh, is the, the, the main, the primary uh, uh, distribution system part of your building water system and, and the secondary uh, horizontal uh, columns or risers or branches that bring the water right out to different areas of the building and the tertiary piping as well, which has been shown to be uh, vulnerable to high uh, elevated Legionella concentration, which is the piping right before the point of use. In general, in the guidance, uh, they recommend to uh, sample in hot water system near the water heater, uh, uh, near or furthest outlets on each branch and near or furthest outlets on each loop if the system is loop. For cold water, point of entry in building and from nearest and furthest outlet as well. Um, I'll give you an example why it's testing is the most def definite way to verify if controls are working. And I'll use uh, two studies here 
uh, one longitudinal study in hospital, many are, are presented in the NASM report and a large compliant, uh, monitor, compliance monitoring database in German hot water system uh, on the right. So starting on the, with the graph on the left hand side on the bottom, you can see the percent positive, uh, e, 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 which is quite high, 100% in a hospital after an outbreak uh, where they had temperature uh, at 45 degrees coming out at the uh, out of the heater water heater and um, they increased that temperature to 65 and greater than 55 at the point of use and used this thermal regime for 10 years and so that numbers there were still some uh, background legionella but but much lower on the right the big figure on the right is really interesting because we're talking about 30,000 points what that says is the percentage of sampling that exceed a thousand per liter, which is the German standard for Legionella species in this case. And there are three types of points here. The, the circles, the red circles are the recirculation loop. The uh, green squares are the flush sample. And the most interesting one, in my opinion, is the distal sample, the uh, triangles, the blue triangles. What this shows is you, you have a, really a cutoff around 50, uh, degree C for uh, recirculation and, and uh, flush samples, and, and it needs a little bit more to bring down that number to a very low uh, minimal uh, exceedances at the distal point. So here, uh, sampling really tells you what works. Uh, another way to look at this is to take look at your building, uh, looking at the primary, the secondary, and the, the tertiary part of it, and, and uh, uh, using a tiered approach, so you can measure, for example, temperature uh, or residual if you have an on-site treatment. Uh, look at your main recirculation system that indicates the overall system risk. Then you do that for the subordinate return loops to understand you know, uh, where risk is di distributed across the different areas of your buildings. And finally, to address the tertiary terminal ends and identifying local issues with defective faucets and showers. And that last part is, is really important because there have been outbreaks documented related to a, a level, a part of a system that, that was um, not meeting uh, the, uh, the control points. And finally, you can decide, depending on how your system works, where to, and when to sample when, when you have this information. Uh, to show, uh, again, that relying on temperature to know where to sample, to, uh, to see, uh, the, to understand the levels that may be present in a large building, you have on the left-hand side distal points uh, uh, positive for Legionella with their number and concentration. And you can see that if you look at classes of temperature, obviously when you have higher temperatures, the it's very clearly lower. On the right-hand side, you can see a two liter uh, sample versus a five minute flush, which is more indicative of the risers. And here again, the difference of temperature is, is quite important in terms of the levels that can be there. Uh, at present at uh, first, first draw or after flushing. Another point that uh, following the, the, the very productive uh, discussions we had on methods uh, just before break is, is to look at these methods, not should I use qPCR, should I use culture? I'm, I'm showing here the results in uh, measured at uh, at-risk points in a hospital after an outbreak uh, across a period of 18 months. And the numbers in, in turquoise are, are QPCR and in darker blue culture. And what can be seen here is that uh, after, in February uh, 2015, when uh, multiple corrective actions were taken, uh, numbers went down very quickly for culture, but they took a longer time to erode with QPCR, showing that it takes a while for your, all your multiple corrective action and your process control to really uh, get rid of Legionella in your system. Uh, there are challenges in monitoring building water systems when it's one thing to decide where and when you're going to monitor, but finding the pipes and without up-to-date drawings is a real challenge in my personal experience. There's also a really striking absence of logs and online monitoring of water temperatures at control point. It is not mandatory in co most codes, and it really is needed to understand that operation meets control measures and almost no measurement of these infectant residual, even in systems with in-situ treatment, which can be a bit puzzling to understand. And accessing sampling location in the different loops is, is often uh, not obvious. You can see the bottom uh, right uh, picture in trying to find a, a, a way to sample in one of these pipes is at all, not at all obvious. 
uh, also collecting the samples in at different points at risk point is is a challenge just identifying all the devices activating electronic faucet pedal activated faucets low flow spray flow and collecting samples is a challenge um, and uh, the, the general recommendations of removing and clearing uh, cleaning aerators and shower heads is, is, is quite a task and, and quite important. Um, I'm going to shift now to cooling towers and, and share a few thoughts about uh, sampling for that. Legionella testing is most often recommended or required. There are regulations in Canada and in the US and, and, and just about everywhere else. Uh, because it's an identified cause of outbreaks and, and also the introduction of regulations has been shown to be effective in reducing the numbers in the cooling towers. There are detailed procedures for safe operation and maintenance that include at risk period of operations and there are inspection procedures to identify components most at risk. What I, I find uh, also is that although there are general features common, but you have to tailor to your program to each cooling tower, and the water management plan will determine the sampling frequency and location. Regulations typically are every month, but uh, process monitoring is continuous in many cases or weekly. And again, focus on points vulnerable to lesional growth and exposure. Defining a, a, an adequate sampling strategy for cooling towers you have to understand that uh, cooling towers are complex have complex treatment regime scale and corrosion uh, 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 and sediment control and the use of oxidant non-oxidant biocides uh, that can influence actually culture results continuous versus discontinuous treatment and and often a system shutdown such as seasonal emergency or just to respond to to uh, demands uh, of use for the, the cooling tower what I've, I've seen and what really is, is quite uh, generally uh, used is, is a process control approach. The, for example, I can give you here operator use of these infection indicators, such as dip slides, for example, is quite common. It's not correlated with Legionella, but it is a, a really nice way to monitor this complex treatment regime. And there is a growing use of rapid methods such as qPCR to rapidly give you a response for an investigation and adjustment of treatment or post disinfection confirmation. Uh, the nice colorful diagram on the right is the M15161 federal guidance in Canada that says basically weekly do a dip slide, monthly do a Legionella culture, but also when you disinfect do a qPCR right away. So after uh, a minimum time after, but to know if your procedure was effective. So the last uh, thought of, of monitoring in cooling towers, there's a very well established practice of automated uh, control of scaling corrosion using online monitoring. I think it's time that we look at innovative approaches to adjust treatment to minimize LP, the outcome of what we're doing in cooling towers. And I'm showing here an example of an automatic autonomous qPCR based online detection uh, uh, technology that identify drifts immediately in a, you know, uh, allowing for immediate adjustment of treatment and uh, having low interference for industrial matrices and, and these in this person. The graph on the bottom is really interesting to look at. Before the device was installed, you can look at for the first period, those are Legionella and GU per ml. Uh, values, you can look at uh, the values that go up and down and the little orange uh, circles are um, schedule and uh, actually shock treatment that was uh, administered. And you can see that after a while with treatment adjustment uh, on the right hand side, first of all, the num numbers come down. And secondly, the scheduled shock treatment are no longer uh, needed. So again, this is you're basically monitoring what you want to control instead of indirect indicators. So last slide, responding to positive Legionella samples, as many other uh, members uh, mentioned in previous talks, expect uh, some positive, but interpret uh, as per building specific acceptable levels or regulations in some cases. Thresholds need to be adapted to the builders, building users and features. Uh, showers, faucets, toilets do not represent the same risk in terms of aerosol formation. Uh, complete absence in a transplant unit is, is, is not something anybody would like to, to challenge. 
but what about low levels in public building faucets? Is that something that uh, should be taken care of immediately and, and constitute a large risk? And the COVID-19 Legionella monitoring that's going on across the US and Canada now uh, is showing some, some positivity and we may force a definition of acceptable levels that were discussed by the panel. Finally, refer to your water management plan. If you don't have one, get one done. Uh, to be able to implement the corrective action if you have positives, to develop reference levels for your system, and to know how to communicate with users and regulators. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Michelle. We're going to turn this over to uh, Mark for his presentation. Oh, okay. Are we uh, looking okay? Yes, looks great. Okay. So, um, so I want to pick up where um, Michelle um, uh, left off and emphasize that water utilities have water management plans as well as you know similar to um, to building systems and these are embedded in a variety of drinking water regulations so when can think about these regulations in the United States we have surface water treatment rules um, so the coliform rules, I have these in plural because there are, you know, uh, long-term one and two. We have disinfection byproduct rules, lead and copper, groundwater, and also operator certification, unregulated contaminant monitoring, um, and security re resilience regulations. So all of these together can think about a set of uh, activities um, that are intended to manage in this case, particularly microbial risks, as well as other risks in drinking water distribution systems, as well as there are a number of different in water industry best practices. So we can think about things that are generally called the 10 state standards. There are the Great Lakes uh, regulations. Um, AWA, um, American Water Works Association has a variety of different standards of practice. There are state requirements. There are fire protection requirements, and many utilities have their own internal set of best practices um, that go uh, above and beyond just, just what the regulations uh, um, uh, re require. And there are many activities that good water utilities routinely operate. For instance, um, while the surface water treatment rule requires uh, maintenance of a disinfectant residual, utilities may have their own activities. Um, they uh, might have root, uh, routine flushing of pipelines to remove sediments and improve disinfectant residuals. They will routinely uh, clean and have maintenance and inspections of storage tanks. Uh, their procedures for pipeline, pipeline repair and pipeline replacement um, can be, be done in hygienic manners and to ways to improve the quality in the distribution system. They practice corrosion control and scale control, and, and these are not only important for protection of the, the pipe assets, but they have impacts on the microbial quality of the water. In systems that practice uh, uh, chloramination, uh, they would have additional procedures for nitrification control, pressure management, cross-connection control, avoidance of stagnation through tank turnover, avoiding dead ends, and system designs. All of these activities, the regulations, the practice, and the activities together define a whole set of activities that utilities do to generally provide water that is uh, you know, safe and um, for their public to consume. And so what do they do to validate that this is, uh, these activities are working? Well, first of all, there are periodic sanitary surveys. So in the surface water treatment rule, under the regulations for Legionella control, it sets a series of treatment techniques. And one of these is to have sanitary surveys. So to go beyond just, and so this is something that typically the state uh, uh, entity uh, do, does. Um, 
at American Water, where I was there, we started to do our own um, internal inspections, and we started to pick up what the outcome of the various sanitary surveys and start communicating that to all of our water utilities. And this is something that I think EPA and the states could do better. They do a lot of sanitary surveys. They find um, deficiencies on that. So I think it would be good to publish that so that um, you know, other utilities that aren't have been uh, inspected can learn from that and be proactively implementing corrective actions. Um, there are uh, required monitoring for disinfectant residuals, um, the surface water treatment rule, uh, says it has to be a detectable residual in 95% of the locations um, and, and, of, um, and, and two consecutive months for surface water systems. Unfortunately, there's no requirement for this in groundwater rule, uh, an area I think is a, is a, is a lapse. Um, they require disinfectant uh, byproduct monitoring for THMs and HAs to balance this microbial and uh, disinfection byproduct risks. They're required monitoring for total coliforms, E. coli, and some utilities do HPC bacteria. Uh, there's required monitoring for corrosion control um, and optimum water quality parameters to make sure that their uh, utility is operating in prop proper way. And of course, under the lead and copper rule, uh, periodically there's monitoring to validate that the optimal water quality parameters, uh, in fact, are delivering um, water that is protective of corrosion for lead and copper. And there are um, um, monitoring for water pressure and water tank levels that utilities typically do. And in addition, you know, um, uh, realistically, uh, utilities are listening to their customers. There's customer complaints around turbidity, taste and odor, discolored water, or water pr pressure. Uh, these are opportunities to respond um, to issues happening in the systems um, to correct any, um, any actions that uh, may lead to water quality prob problems. And so we think about the set of regulations, the set sets of activities, the ongoing monitoring <clears throat> to validate um, that the water that's being produced is, is, is safe and wholesome. And now we address this question of uh, Legionella ma management because you know, we've seen um, year after year an increase in Legionella outbreaks. So, uh, so after today, today you know, about two thirds of the waterborne outbreaks are related to Legionnaire's disease. And, um, and utilities uh, recognize that, that this waterborne, although most of these outbreaks occur in, in buildings and cooling towers and uh, situations, they have a shared responsibility. What they do provides water, water to these buildings. And so it's important that they are doing um, their part of that equation to make sure that all the monitoring, all the process control that's happening in the distribution system is adequate for Legionella management. And the problem with this is that you know, fe typical fecal indicators that are monitored are not you know, predictive of Legionella uh, pneumophila occurrence or Legionella management. And uh, a gap in the current regulations, they can permit up to 5% of the distribution system not to contain a disinfectant residual, and that's, that's problematic. And we have seen uh, a, a few outbreaks uh, one in New Jersey related to a lack of chlorine in a storage tank. And just last year, there was a, 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 an issue in a distribution system in, in Maine where part of it uh, routinely didn't have a chlorine residual and was related to some cases of Legionnaire's disease. So it is an important responsibility that utilities have. And I think the availability of easy to use Legionella and Amophila methods, as we've talked about, both culture, rapid culture methods, as well as uh, rapid PCR methods, now start to put in the hands of the water utilities tools that they can look at their system and ask this question, um, am I doing a good job um, for Legionella management? And one of the biggest problems of this is a lack of guidance on responding to positive results. And so this has frozen a lot of utilities not to do any testing because if we do testing, you know, what do we do if we've got a positive results? And so to help this uh, process, um, I developed uh, earlier this year some um, uh, a guidance manual on developing Legionella uh, monitoring program. And this is uh, uh, put out as a suggestion for water utilities to kind of you know, think about this process and kind of get out of the 
um, to start doing um, additional monitoring in their distribution system. And I offer this as a straw man. You can like it, you can hate it, you can propose something different, but it's important that we start this dialogue and we come to some kind of guidance and direction um, so that we can validate the activities that are being done by utilities to make sure that we have confidence that they're doing, um, um, having the result of managing Legionella in the distribution system. So this manual covers seven major steps. I don't have time today to go through the whole thing. Um, you can find it, it's, it's free, available on my website. This was also developed um, in uh, collaboration with the uh, people from I IDEX, and so it's available on their uh, website as well. It's just a guide to try to help um, utilities get going. The first part of this is to develop program objectives. Why do you want to do this? What are you trying to get out of this? What do you want to know? And so it steps through a lot of different thinking about, well, why would I do that? And what do I want to do? Because ultimately the monitoring you do and the tests you do is going to relate to what, why are you doing this and what are your objectives? The second part is real, also really important is identify uh, the monitoring team and begin to educate stakeholders. And so there are a variety of different internal stakeholders to utilities different uh, players is, you know, think about engaging your communications team, your senior management, your legal uh, operations of both treatment and distribution. So it steps through the thinking about that and how to engage them. And then it also talks about external stakeholders, your public health regulator, your environmental regulator. In some states that may be one and the same uh, agency, many states there are separate agencies. Um, the uh, large buildings, uh, your um, um, your customers, your large customers, your media, uh, uh, NGOs in your community. So it starts thinking about, about that. I'm going to start talking about in a little more detail how to developing your monitoring program, how to communicate those results, and then um, and then uh, so focusing on those those two aspects right now. So once you've gone through your protocols, you engage it, you have buy-in that you want to do this, you have buy-in on how you're going to respond to that. You could think about, well, where do I sample from? And there are a variety of different approaches since this is a voluntary activity by a utility simply to understand their system better. One approach would be to use your protocol for monitoring locations. You have lots of data. Uh, years and years, reams of data on not only what is the, you know, coliform and E. coli, maybe HBC, but you know what your chlorine residual is, you know what kind of normal would be for those locations. And therefore, you can take your, your uh, Legionella monitoring and put that in context of this larger data. So there's an advantage. And the total coliform stations should be already representative of your distribution system. But going on beyond that, some utilities may want to look at their reservoir and storage tanks. There have been uh, cases, like I mentioned, where um, uh, lapses in management of the uh, storage tanks have led to outbreaks. There have been studies showing Legionella occurrence in, um, in the sediment of some storage tanks. Utilities may also focus their monitoring on locations of potentially vulnerable populations. So if it's not already included in your routine monitoring, you may want to pick up samples near hospitals or nursing homes or parts of the system where there's uh, more elderly populations. Some utilities may also think about their dis dis disinfected byproduct monitoring. These tend to be more weighted towards the ends of the systems with longer detention time. So it's another way of thinking about you know, monitoring your system. And I also start to talk about utilities when maybe thinking about their municipal and utility owned buildings. Um, you know, those serve the public. And just as we talked about having a building water management plan for these types of buildings, since they serve the public, that might be a, a way for utilities and cities to lead by example about, you know, uh, uh, having water management plans and having monitoring there. So next part is thought, thinking about determining sampling uh, frequency. And this really depends on, on laboratory resources, um, so it wouldn't necessarily have to do every total coliform monitoring location every week, um, but you, one can um, start to focus this on times uh, when there are war warm water temperatures. 
Uh, we found uh, in uh, some studies of uh, drinking water distribution systems, detection of Legionella lamophila when water temperatures were warm, particularly in around 25 degrees centigrade, which for some parts of uh, utilities, um, uh, that may be only during summer months, but other utilities in, this, in, in warmer climates, that may be more um, uh, uh, common during times of the year. And then we start thinking about, well, what do I collect? You might want to, you certainly want to monitor, I think as a starting point, Legionella mophila, as we just discussed, adding the other Legionella species can be informative, but, but um, may give us signals that aren't necessarily related to uh, major health risks. Uh, certainly monitoring for total coli from E. coli to put that data in context. And my slide is moving forward. I am not touching it. Um, certainly want to look at free and total uh, chlorine. If you're uh, a chloraminate system, you want to measure for monochloramine, temperature, pH, and, um, and additional parameters to look at evidence of nitrification. In all cases, utilities should be following their established uh, procedures and quality control for these parameters. Um, also then to think about um, the people that are, are collecting the sample, determine that responsibility, the scheduling, the training, and whether the sample is flushed or not. As Michelle had talked about, that first flush sample frequently can have higher levels, but if the purpose of the objective of the monitoring program is understand the quality in the distribution system, then, um, then, you know, then the flush the sample, like routine bacteriological monitoring that utilities do, may be appropriate. And to help with this training, working with uh, folks at IDEX, with uh, help develop an online education course that's free, you can log on at that location, and can step you through uh, it can be a way of training your sam samplers and, and people around um, this, this procedure. And then select the locations. Uh, what's different about uh, uh, Legionella monitoring is the samples are transported at ambient temperature rather than chilling them because they are uh, organisms that like warm water and then try to process that sample as quickly. Um, ideally, um, the location should be uh, collected from water directly from the, the, dis, the distribution system uh, versus uh, inside buildings. And, um, and so um, that um, if you had dedicated sampling stations that are direct collected, uh, connected directly to the main, that can have some um, advantages. And then I have procedures to follow up. If you collect a sample and find that there's no chlorine, you don't wanna wait seven days during the, uh, for incubation of culturable results. Um, to have uh, immediate follow-up. So have procedures. If you find something unusual, uh, you can communicate that and crews can uh, 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 address that promptly. And then, so it's important in doing this to have a communications plan. And this is a major section of this guidance document. And I think the stated utility goal is we expect we should have no Legionella and Mopla in our distribution system, but um, some research has been done uh, already have shown that even in well-run systems, we can occasionally see Legionella lamophila at low levels in transient uh, currents and distribution systems. So, you know, expect to find uh, po positive results. And so I put this out as a suggested guidance. It's, it's, it's my uh, contribution to try to get out of the starting blocks. So if you have low levels of Legionella lamophila, and repeat samples show that they are negative, then this transitory infrequent detection uh, is not a, a large concern, provided the rest of your water quality and system operations are normal. Um, if you start to have more frequent detection, of course, this is going to depend on the number of samples you collect, but so I say, you know, more than 20 or 30 percent, um, then it starts to say that even though the levels are low, but you're seeing a lot of occurrence, then maybe there, this is a trigger to start looking at your system and trying to look at, well, maybe some, what's going on? Are there any deficiencies? Do I have any kind of main breaks? I've done any kind of flushing? Any kind of activities that might re be related to microbial occurrence? And then if they're in these more um, intermediate range between one and 10 per mil or 1,000 to uh, 10,000 per liter, um, this indicates that conditions may be favorable for growth, and now it's time to start taking 
um, preventive action. So look at there's low residuals, maybe go to flushing the system, cleaning the storage tanks, taking activities. And this would be a time to engage the public health regulator and con conduct a system evaluation. We already have this precedent under the total coal firm rule to do a level one or level two assessment. So the similar kind of approach of looking at your system could be done for Legionella management. And then I would suggest if Legionella is greater than 10 per mil, still lower than this uh, um, uh, 50 per mil or 50,000 per liter, so you're starting to have uh, action levels here that are you know, below this level, then it's starting to say, you know, you don't really have control of your system, it's, unfavor it's favorable for growth, and now to increase disinfectant residuals, start the flush, engage um, the environmental regulators, and start engaging the public in notification. Um, now, boil, boiling the water isn't you know, the same as it's because this risk is not necessarily drinking, but certainly advising elderly and immunocompromised uh, around activities they could do to protect themselves from aerosolization of the water. And I think a key part of this is the communication part program. So consider posting updates on your Legionella monitoring, uh, engage stakeholders as we've talked about, uh, consider including a statement on Legionella in your, your annual or biannual uh, consumer confidence uh, report. And the Water Research Foundation, as we talked before, um, has done a number of projects in this. And I point you to project 4664, but it's on customer med uh, messaging on opportunistic pathogens and plumbing systems, has a lot of templates for doing CCR reports, for doing uh, customer engagements, for setting up a web uh, website on your utility webpage to, to engage customers around uh, Legionella and Legionella management. And so a part of this project, and before I left American Water, we set up an example, this is still on the American Water page, you go to amwater.com, uh, look at the, you know, search for Legionella there. You can find some, an example um, that was developed for this uh, research uh, project on engaging uh, various stakeholders, your homeowners, your large building, your, your um, uh, healthcare uh, facilities on, on Legionella. So I think for utilities, um, you know, Legionella is an uh, uh, increasing public health issue. Uh, one that utilities and their customers should be aware of. There are methods available to utilities uh, that are easy enough that utilities can validate their own treatment processes for Legionella control. Guidelines and training are available to help you get out of the starting block. It's important to engage your uh, regulators and your other stakeholders in this process. It's a shared responsibility um, and should be proactively communicating with the customers on Legionella management. And as so several speakers already said, this is particularly important now uh, during the pandemic when we have stay at home owners and where large commercial buildings uh, may have more stagnant water that hi highlight these concerns. So they're highlighting the concerns in the buildings and very invariably it's gonna ask the question, well, what's our utility doing? What kind of data we have in, in the systems? So it's time to become proactive on that. So with that, I turn that back over to um, you, Joan, for our question and answer period. And thank you, Mark. And thank you, Michelle. That was a great overview. And uh, thank you, audience, for hanging with us and submitting the, the questions. Um, in addition to having Mark Le Chevalier and Michelle Provost here, and um, Amy Pruden is still with us, uh, Chuck Haas um, and Paul Vanderweelen. And we have other committees uh, members that um, are here to help answer questions, uh, including John Lutzen, uh, Michelle Swanson, and Ruth Berkelman. So um, let's get into this, uh, into the, the Q&A. Um, Michelle, I've got um, the first question, Michelle Provost, uh, first question for you. I think during this pandemic, Everybody's staying home. There's a lot of buildings that are not occupied. Um, the water is not being used. Could you address this issue of stagnation and, and how widespread Legionella, Legionella might be in these plumbing systems? And what do we know to date? Um, are you, uh, there's some several other things that um, 
that comes to mind here too. Should we be, should we be flushing uh, more routinely because of this, um, uh, these unoccupied buildings because of COVID? Yes, Joan, a actually, that's a really hot question these days because uh, uh, we've never faced such long stagnation times. It's, these shutdowns are so long and, and even when buildings are reoccupied, sometimes it's just a few people, just partial use. So yes, there are issues and, and there are many guidance, many focusing on Legionella that have been issued in the last six months. And I think the, um, and all wanting to concentrate on flushing and shock disinfection of these systems. And I think the data is just coming out. There are about 15 studies going on. Uh, Purdue uh, launched a, a collaborative group and I'm part of that group and, and conducting these recommissioning studies. Um, and, and we will have data to show, is it always bad or does it depend how the building was before? In my personal experience in the number of buildings, sometimes it's fine. And no, you hardly get any Legionella. And in others, uh, it, it can be quite striking, uh, extensive high numbers in showers. So yes, I think this will push the industry uh, to have these, these levels that are manageable and to implement the water management plants that are so needed in these buildings. Tough off mute there. Thank you so much. Um, Paul, um, there's quite a few questions uh, that remain about PCR and, and culture method and how we might um, use these um, either in simultaneously or, um, you know, in a, in maybe a, a sequence. Um, and, and how do we adapt, you know, these, uh, or, or how do we mandate culture methods um, you know, uh, for different environments? Um, and, and should we be mandating that both QPCR and culture methods be used in these uh, water management plans? Yes, I'm absolutely in favor to uh, mand mandate also the QPCR methods in, in these management plans. Um, but I, of course, I don't know the situation in the US, but in Europe, it's difficult because of the regulations and that the national health institutes that advise the governments are really um, focused, stay focused on the culturing methods. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I think it was the golden standard, um, but it has a lot of limitations as well. Um, but they still think that the cultivating methods are a better indicator for um, for public health risks than the qPCR, but I don't think that the data is there that really shows this. So, I mean, there is this issue of viability, but again, I think if you start monitoring with qPCR, you have much faster results. A negative is a negative. You don't have to worry. Um, and when it gets positive, it's time to take action. And one of the action points can be to cultivate in, in the next rounds. So that's really my, I think that's, the best way to proceed in this. Yeah, you know, um, Ruth, this brings up sort of a, a, a related question, you know, in terms of monitoring during an outbreak, because, um, you know, you might want to isolate the organism and this type of thing, but you need rapid results at the mm -hmm. same time. And, and a lot of health departments, local health departments may not have the capacity for this, or they may miss certain things just because they're looking just for pneumophila with the, uh, you know, ur urinary antigen test. Uh, can you comment on, on what we think health departments should maybe be doing under these circumstances? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at. Um, During outbreak investigations, what, what kind of advice can we give health departments about monitoring using PCR culture methods? Yeah, I think during outbreak investigations, um, they usually are Legionella pneumophila because that's usually what they're detecting. If they detect other species or other sero groups, it's usually because they're doing cultures on bronchoscopies or something systematically, or there's a clear outbreak where they have to look elsewhere. 
but usually it is Legionella pneumophila. And I know New York City used the, QP, the, the PCR and they screened um, cooling towers that way. And then as, as Paul said, uh, they then targeted those to, to culture them. But that gave wow. them a very rapid way to, to um, you know, they have thousands and thousands of cooling towers. So it really was helpful. Yeah, so there's some, there's some precedent there. We could use that as guidelines for other health departments that haven't had to, to go through the process that New York has gone through. But you can, you know, if you have, you know, epidemiologically, if you actually figure out it's probably one of five, 10 cooling towers, what New York City did was go ahead and culture simultaneously to the PPCR. Uh-huh, yeah. So, so Amy, this goes to, uh, you know, I know you were involved with the Flint outbreak and, you know, if we have these widespread kind of community-based outbreaks and it, it looked like there was a lot of respiratory disease, you know, how, how do we look for the broader universe of, of opportunistic pathogens? What, 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 should we, what should we be doing? Um, is, there, is there information on... on uh, you know, monitoring in the, under those circumstances and, and well, uh, just, yeah, <laughs> just that, this trade-off, really, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's a million dollar question. And I think it really speaks to the fact we have a safe drinking water act. We don't have a safe breathing water act. And there are a lot of other microorganisms in our tap water. And fortunately, most of them are harmless and quite interesting to me as a microbiologist. But, you know, others besides Legionella pneumophila cause disease. So we have other species of Legionella. And we have other organisms that um, are transmitted through inhaling the water aerosols. So non tuberculous uh, lung. Our non non tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease is a big example of that, and we we could have a whole other Legionella or a whole other National Academies report on mycobacteria. Um, so it's a challenge, and I think it it takes coordination. So, you know, working with folks like Ruth in the the public health sector, getting a better handle on community acquired pneumonia and these lung diseases, and, and you know what are they, who has them, where are they likely coming from, and then linking that uh, with what's in the water. And so my, my initial reaction when I saw those questions was, oh no, <laughs> it's so hard to get our heads around Nella. You know, now we've got to worry about other organisms. And, um, but at the same time, we should be proactive, right? We've, we've lessons in not being proactive with Legionella. So the extent that we can coordinate and test the water for other organisms and coordinate with public health agencies. I think the more monitoring on both ends and trying to connect the dots um, will we'll achieve, uh, you know, the real end goal here is, is uh, improve public health and prevention of disease. Yeah, I think everybody's wondering whether if we, if we implement approaches to control Legionella, are we actually going to be controlling some of these other opportunistic uh, pathogens? And I think in some cases, we don't know how to answer that. Yeah, so that's a big challenge. And in our research, you know, we, we have the luxuries researchers to look at multiple pathogens. So we do try to look at Legionella uh, mycobacteria, pseudomonas, acanthamoeba, even brain-eating amoeba, we've done studies on that. And so, so far, it is often challenging to find the conditions that work for all of them, quite frankly. But I think we need to, to keep doing that kind of work. And there's, there's commonalities among these organisms, right? So they tend to like biofilms, they tend to like warm temperatures, disinfectants help for most of them, but, you know, they have different uh, CT values, but you know, I, I think there's there's reason to hope, and you know, it only makes sense if we're going to go to all this effort to try to tackle as much disease that's transmitted through inhaling water droplets as as we can. Yeah. So so Mark, um, 
the distribution system may be seeding some of these buildings and, and you had mentioned dead ends and things like this and, and in your presentation areas where you should monitor monitor do you have data on like geographic changes warmer climates like florida compared to michigan <laughs> or um places that might get warmer like elevated storage tanks um uh, should we be testing these different, uh, you know, places in the distribution system? Can you expand upon that a little bit? Well, it might be surprising given that we've known about Legionella for more than 40 years. There's relatively little data for monitoring distribution systems. It's been recognized, you know, buildings and cooling towers. There's, there's a ton of studies, hospitals, there's a ton of studies. There's actually relatively few that have looked at distribution systems. So, we, we published last year um, two studies of distribution systems and, um, and there, well, so there's limited data really answer the question at the end of the day. We did look at storage tanks um, because we know, you know, um, that they can warm up, you can stratify, they may, may lose disinfectant residuals. Um, uh, of the, um, you know, thousand or so samples we collected, uh, there, we, we didn't see the storage tanks were any more positive than others, but certainly that should be an area of focus like I had, I had uh, uh, mentioned. Interesting though, we did see more Legionella pneumophila in free chlorinated systems than we did in chloraminated systems. And in the National Academy report, there's a section lo you know, looking at this and there is a, there's a inter you know, curious trend that not only just on outbreaks and on occurrence data, uh, look at this time and time again, chloraminated systems tend to have less Legionella outbreaks, less Legionella occurrence than in free chlorinated systems. Um, and so since in the United States, we tend to have more chloraminated systems in southern parts of the United States, maybe that's, maybe that's an unintended consequence of disinfection byproduct. These systems oh. have incorporated procedures that have, you know, you know, I just ironically um, had less, less, uh, have great, greater protection from Legionella. And when you look at the geography of Legionella outbreaks, it's that Midwest, and so tends to be more uh, uh, mid-Atlantic seaboard. Um, so um, it, where you start to use less chloraminated water. So uh, we don't really know. We definitely would benefit from more monitoring, more data, and, you know, like I said, um, uh, and so that will inform all of us. So I, yeah, I think yeah. if we can get out of the starting blocks and do more of that, we will be in a better position to answer these kinds of questions. And I've yeah, always felt that it's important to uh, um, uh, enable the utilities, whenever I've been able to enable the operator, they're far more creative in the questions they will ask than me as the researcher. So yeah, I do encourage the utilities to, um, you know, uh, you know, jump in yeah. the water um, and 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 look at their systems. Yeah, uh, John, um, you have uh, been involved in the monitoring of hospitals, and I know that you focus on these exposure sites, taps, and showers, and things like that. Is there interest uh, to to look at what's coming into the system, or these storage towers, or other, you know, um, other parts of the, the water system where Legionella could be amplifying and then seed seed uh, taps? Sure, historically, um, we've, we've always looked at uh, starting out in water tanks and, and the incoming source water supplies. Um, I mean, one of, one of the few areas that people really pay attention to is, is that hospitals generically have two sources of water coming in. And if they're both open at the same time, the flow rates through those water supply lines is not sufficient to kind of keep things moving. Um, so you tend to get some dead leg condition, conditions in some of them. But we look through from the beginning of the system where it comes in from the utility all the way through to the end distal device and monitor those and culture those uh, areas on a very regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, maybe uh, Paul, you and Ruth could uh, talk a bit about how do we how do we generally increase awareness around Legionella and Legionnaires disease? Um, you know, how do we work outside the healthcare arena and, and interact with, with building owners, 
utilities, um, you know, uh, and work through this sort of complex system where there's multiple partners actually have to be involved to control Legionella in some cases. Paul, why don't you go through first talking about what, what are they doing in Europe to uh, improve public awareness? First, I have to unmute. So, um, sadly enough, I have to say that in Europe, the attention for Legionella in, in the different European countries comes up after an outbreak. So, apparently, you need an outbreak of Legionella before there is awareness. <clears throat> that was the case in the Netherlands. We had one in 1999 that gave a lot of awareness and a lot of effort into uh, uh, Legionella and how we can control the problem. But we saw in other countries like Germany, there was not really much happening. Then they, in Germany, they had this big outbreak with a Bavarian cooling tower. And then the awareness started uh, also in, 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 in Germany. And that's actually the case in all the countries that you see now. Belgium is, is getting more involved because they had, they had a, a large outbreak with a cooling tower. So yeah, unfortunately, it seems to be that you have to have an outbreak before you get the attention and the awareness. The only thing I think that we can do in this is um, keep posting stories, uh, not only in uh, the scientific journals that we as uh, scientists normally uh, publish our uh, results in, but also try to uh, write stories for newspapers or magazines or technical magazines for for people working in the installation uh, uh, of uh, premise plumbing and things like that. Because I think that's the only way to get more awareness and also try to convince um, the people who are in, in politics that this is a serious problem and that we should take a look at it. Because it's it's also a matter that the, that the politicians should be aware of it and think if they can help to solve the problem. But that requires a lot of proactive um, um, yeah, response of us in, in the community, you could say. Mm -hmm. Ruth, what, what should we be doing in the US? Well, it's interesting. Paul has really nailed it when he said an outbreak brings attention to it and you don't want the outbreak. So we're doing everything possible to prevent the outbreaks. Um, but it's interesting with the public, one thing we can use COVID as an opportunity to say it matters what causes your pneumonia. Because often, you know, patients get this diagnosis of pneumonia and they never ask what kind of pneumonia. And, and teaching people with COVID even that there are various kinds of pneumonia and how you can get it might help with the public awareness, but everything Paul has said is right. The other issue is that we need to strengthen the health departments and we need to do a lot more in many of the states to tie the environmental health with the public health. And in many cases, they're siloed. Sometimes they're different departments. Sometimes they're divisions within the same. And again, New York State, and to Paul's point, this is probably because of their outbreaks. They have done a lot to actually um, decrease of getting the report of a Legionnaire's disease case to actually getting it investigated with environmental health, a dual investigation. And, you know, highlighting even smaller outbreaks would help, but obviously the uh, litigation issue is always there too. So it's, it's a problem, but I agree with Paul and, I think there's a lot we can do. Yeah. And I think it comes down to some, some cases having an approach for monitoring so we have some of this, these, these data even before the outbreak. We know that we've got these sporadic cases and all this kind of thing. And, you know, we've got, we're learning new things. I mean, um, uh, Michelle Swanson, we're learning a lot of new things about the ecology of Legionella. And how does this translate? How do we translate this to the new testing that we could do? And, and how do we get, um, you know, uh, the peer reviewed literature into, you know, into a program that might certify these methods? Do you have some, some comments on that? I know you've done a lot on, on working on these very sophisticated methods for looking at Legionella. 
Well, you're right, Joan. There is a lot that we don't know about the variety of Legionella out there. And there's a lot of very interesting biology. But I also really appreciate the discussion today. Um, the practitioners that are working on water management plans and, and working with building owners to keep, keep the water safe, they need um, really high level um, information that they can use on a rapid basis. So I think the reality is that we're going to need um, years of research, um, funding, and better communication among uh, the different stakeholders um, before we can deliver uh, more specific um, tests for surveillance and, and for diagnosis. So there, yeah. there's a lot of work to be done. And of course, we're competing um, with other uh, infectious diseases, and, and COVID certainly deserves the attention it's getting now. Yeah, and I think harmonizing the PCR method, standardizing it in some way for water, you know, is it, getting getting these methods certified in some way. And I don't know who might do that, but that's going to, I think, help us move forward as well in terms of moving it into practice, moving the research into practice. Yeah, uh, Mark, do you have some some comments on that that comparison of culture versus PCR? Uh, that needs to take place for the water industry to be comfortable uh, using the PCR methodology? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, while PCR is a staple of research laboratories, um, you know, many, certainly of the medium and smaller utilities, you know, that's, they, they don't do, do that. And that's why I said, you know, developing a, a commercial kit uh, whether it's you know, for culture or for PCR, is really important to provide them the tools so that, I mean, they, they are competent laboratory technicians, but they you know, may not have, they certainly don't have a clean room for PCR prep and, and, and all the things that we would normally do in a re research laboratory. I, I do think that the PCR ha ha certainly plays a role, like we had said, uh, as an operational tool um, for quick information to know how to adjust the system. And we had some, some success with a viability PCR. We had used a thidium on an azide along with a, a PCR, and we certainly saw a difference in, in signal here. Now, we know that that's limited. Uh, UV inactivated, there's some report from EPA that copper or silver inactivation doesn't necessarily translate. So I, I think we should need to have some more um, development of those methods, um, comparison of different approaches so that we can have a viability, but we would have to understand the limitations of that, of that work. And so, you know, I mean, there's no perfect method. All of them have, you know, some deficiencies as long as we understand uh, what we're using and what, you know, for what purpose and, and what are the limitations. Um, yeah, I think all of these methods can be useful. Um, in uh, achieving the objectives that the different users want to use. Yeah, I know under the Clean Water Act, the states, many states have, have started to certify and approve PCR methods for beach monitoring. It's a slightly different, you know, approach, but it, we start talking about drinking water, potable water. Then we're talking about a national approach, and it seems like this national approach might be needed um, and, and the interplay between, you know, the water distribution system and the, and the, and the buildings, um, you know, I, how, you know, how do we, how do we get there to the, to that national level under the Safe Drinking Water Act? Chuck, I know you've, you've done a lot with, uh, as you look, as we looked at new emerging pathogens with cryptosporidium and others in drinking water, how are we going to get there with, with Legionella? Well, I think, you know, one issue that we're dancing around here is, is where does the responsibility lie and where should it lie for providing safe water at the tap? And I think one thing that became clear with our committee, Joan, is that there's a glaring hole in the Safe Drinking Water Act in that there really isn't strong enough coverage for a utility or for that matter, state uh, primacy agency to have jurisdiction about how water quality is maintained within you know, the last hundred feet from the water meter to the tap. And so I think we, we need to do that. And then we can talk about methods and techniques um, to do that as well. 
Yeah, you know, that goes to what we, you know, we kind of have a framework and, and we've used QMRA within the distribution system and, and potable water. But, you know, we get into the buildings and we're really looking at some of these prevention strategies, uh, temperature being one of the key things I think that came out in the report. And, and Michelle uh, Provo, I wonder if you could just kind of, how do we balance all this about, you know, the temperature, the scalding, the mixing valves, uh, how are we gonna go about making, you know, getting more information so we can make recommendations and they don't seem at odds with each other. And they could, they could move into guidelines like ASHRAE. Yeah, and balancing also energy conservation and put it in the mix as well. Those are really important points. And as the data, it's really data driven. And when we worked so hard during the committee meetings to look at the evidence from thousands of points in, the, in Europe to show what worked and didn't work uh, for temperature. But then we also recognize the risk for scalding, which must be uh, addressed and introduced probably another risk, which is uh, no uh, TMVs. Uh, so mixing valves in there, but mixing valves like any other device in the building must be managed as to minimize those risks. And that is selecting a mixing valve as close possible to the outlet, a simple one, what that one that can be maintained and cleaned and hopefully in the future, we can find ways to not rely on temperature when we have evidence that other, uh, other approaches to control in buildings are efficient. When we work so hard to try to gather the evidence that was there, there was no such evidence clear, but there, there are papers coming out every month now and, and with long-term studies that will help us um, now find new solutions. Perhaps temperature won't be needed to be so high in the future, but at this point, there's no evidence to go in the other way, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, Amy, if you can add on to that because certainly water conservation and water flows, water use is, is all part of this. And um, I think there's enough evidence to know that there's low levels of, of Legionella that can be found at least by PCR in the distribution system. It's seeding the buildings. Um, so what do we do about this? You know, these, this issue of, of flows and, and trying to implement approaches that uh, uh, decrease the chance of amplification. Yeah, that's a good question. And it, it just, everything is highlighting how things are interconnected and there's trade-offs. And so in my presentation, I emphasized how, you know, we think of Legionella mainly growing in the building plumbing and cooling towers, and that's where there's the most vulnerabilities. But I, I saw some points in the chat, like, well, sometimes it's coming from the distribution system. And, and so I, I do think it's important to start looking there and, and, and times are changing. People are using less water, right? So there, there is starting to, which, which is a good thing, right? We want water conservation, but the trade-off is, you know, we didn't rebuild our distribution systems for this lower water use. So we do have more stagnation and, and maybe opportunity for growth in the distribution system than we've traditionally considered. So, you know, I think it's important initiatives like, like Mark promoted that you know, we need to start looking there as well. And, and another big trade-off is, is energy, as, as Michelle alluded, you know, there, there'd been a movement to turn down the temperature and water heaters and save energy. And well, you know, now we just lost our one major evidence-based means of controlling Legionella is elevated temperature. So, you know, the, the challenge with Legionella really is systems thinking and, and thinking through all these details and kind of balancing the trade-offs. Yeah, and, and how are we really going to, to um, get a handle on disinfection in, in the buildings themselves? I always feel like it's, it's still a black hole, even monitoring disinfection residuals in buildings and maintaining it. Um, Mark, is the water industry gonna give us some advice to, uh, to building owners? Uh, you know, in regard to both monitoring and maintaining disinfectant residuals, this is another issue, right? It's temperature, flow, disinfection. 
It, it is, and it is a sticky issue. Um, you know, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, if buildings implement booster disinfection uh, or treatment of the water, you know, potentially they could be uh, counted as a supplier of potable water and they fall under the regulations. And, and, uh, and that has been a uh, disincentive to, to buildings to, to do what they know they need to do. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, under a project from the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators uh, last year looked at all the regulations and it's, it's a bit of a patchwork across the states, how different states handle this. Um, but I, 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 th I think there needs to be clear guidance from the states of you know, your buildings, if you do this, you know, we're not going to create a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of disincentives for you to, to do this. But, um, and, and so, and there are some loopholes, but you know, we don't have a safe building water act, I think as people have said. So we do have a, a, a gap there. And you know, God knows if we can have our Congress to address this, but uh, you know, absence of that, I think there needs to be, uh, it, it certainly falls under the state purview um, and how that's handled can be a disincentive. I, I do think, as I, I mentioned, utilities communicating with building owners around what can be done, what they're doing, what, util, what building owners can, could do um, is a useful act, activity. And I wanna just emphasize not having this information, putting your head in the sand is not gonna make the problem go away. And uh, in fact, you know, not knowing and not, not, is not a protection against liability. So you know, my career in American Water, you know, with your help, we started looking at uh, cryptosporidium and giardia. We've taken on viruses, mycobacterium, legionella, you know, all different chemicals. And the more that we did that, the more people said, you're doing a good job. So I, I think it's definitely having that information and managing that information so that you can manage the discussion is a position of utilities to be in, you know, power and, and knowledge. And, and, uh, and, and certainly we don't see you know, avoiding that discussion is not a leadership role. It doesn't protect you. It's not a safe place to be. So I, I encourage you to, um, you know, to step out and, and do the, the, uh, the you know, the, the things that you can do um, to engage your buildings, engage your publics. Uh, they will trust you more for that. Uh, understanding that there are, you know, gaps that we don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that means that's going to have to come along with the, the, this data and, and developing more data. And, and hopefully that will stimulate some of these uh, use of these newer methods and uh, better methods. Uh, Paul, in Europe, it looks like there's some really new techniques coming out um, that uh, might be useful as, as screens the lateral flow technologies and, and things like that. Is, are there any comments you'd like to make about how fast those kinds of technologies might come to fruition not, for use? I'm not quite sure what technologies you are talking about. Well, um, I guess there's the, the spark, is it called a, a, a some kind of, uh, was, uh, didn't Michelle uh, pre uh, present some of the new types of PCR methods or was it you, Amy? Mm -hmm. um, that so were in the start in, uh, to to be able to measure that locations. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. So these, but that's not only coming from Europe. That's also coming from uh, I know Canada, for instance, and maybe also the U.S. Yeah. Um, so that these are uh, really new techniques, and and hopefully they can help us uh, a lot because I mean, if you're no longer dependent on a a laboratory, I think that can also really improve uh, monitoring. Mm. So if you can use this, these uh, facilities on site and they are easy to handle, no, uh, not very difficult, then they really could uh, attribute to, uh, to get a, bit, uh, a better sight on what's happening in your water system. I know that the, the, the main issue with, with these uh, qPCR at site um, machines are that the qPCR in itself, it's not really a problem. You can do that perfectly on site, but you also have to take your water sample, you have to filter it and you have to extract the DNA from it. 
And I think that's still a challenge in all these new devices that you get a good recovery of your DNA from your uh, water samples. But still, uh, I mean, uh, they are out there now and I think people are interested. We are also doing projects uh, on this to compare it with the normal qPCR in the labs. So I can imagine that, that, that it really processes quite quickly in the next few years and that also these issues with uh, uh, DNA isolations can be solved uh, quite nice. So, and then if we have those machines, I think it's, yeah, it can really help us also in outbreak uh, situations that you can do on site uh, monitoring what's happening. So um, yeah, really helpful, yeah. but we need again, more data, more monitoring. There's yeah. a lot of these uh, things <laughs> that are out there. Well, that kind of brings me to a, a final uh, point. And I'd like each of the panel members to maybe make a, at least think about one statement or one uh, one point they could they could end with and in terms of a development of a national surveillance program how would we how could we go about doing that how would it be useful um, produce useful data um, what approaches should we use um, to to get at some of these uh, the uh, the need for uh, data in such complex systems, everything from the source uh, to the exposure sites. Um, uh, I, let's see, I, I don't, Amy, maybe I'll just call on you first uh, and put you on the spot while everybody else is thinking about their comments. <laughs> you keep picking on me. I know. <laughs> well, you have so much knowledge in that brain, so. <laughs> you say so. Well, um, an idea does come to mind. I think um, it, actually with the COVID situation, there's a lot of lessons learned and um, a big one is data sharing. I'm a big fan of data sharing and it's been really encouraging to see all the communities monitoring the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and wastewater and not worrying about, you know, the like sharing data and who gets mm -hmm. credit, what, but just putting it out there and sharing methods and standardizing. And I think we can really follow suit with, with Legionella and it, it's starting to happen already with some of the stagnation monitoring that's occurred. So I think a platform that people can really start to share. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, John, what are your thoughts on a national monitoring uh, program? What should we be doing? Well, I, I think uh, sharing as much data as we can. And I think that the, you know, there's so many variables involved on the building side and in, in healthcare and all the rest of the places. Um, I think that if we could take some of the lessons learned, particularly those from contact tracing and, and kind of uh, apply that to when we have a, a patient in the hospital that tests positive to really pinpoint what the location that they're getting the disease from is. Um, we've struggled with that for years. There's never been, a, and one of the things that the, one of the gaps that I know the committee identified is there was no direct correlation in any data related to uh, clinical disease and or environmental cultures at the same time. So I think that's one of the things where we need to bring those two silos, if you will, together is to bring the data associated with environmental testing uh, closer to the actual clinical t testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the difference between exposure and then outcomes. Um, Chuck, what are your thoughts on national surveillance program? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is standardize methods, both um, for culture-based methods and for molecular-based methods, so that we're comparing apples to apples. Um, but, you know, we, we might also take advantage of ways to um, have mon monitoring done in a more <clears throat> mandated way. And, you know, let me make an analogy to, to what was done or what is being done with radon. So many states now require <clears throat> uh, sellers of buildings to do a radon survey before the building is sold. Um, 
you know, is it not reasonable in some circumstances to require the same thing for opportunistic pathogens and Legionella in particular? Um, and the same thing also in terms of using the insurance industry as a tool to get monitoring implemented, at least at the point where a policy is sold. So I think those are, those are some ideas that we need to flesh out. Oh, quite interesting. Um, Michelle Swanson. I agree that we need to get the stakeholders um, uh, talking across disciplines and so that the, the funding that goes into the research to really be targeted at um, uh, tools that we can put in the hands of the people who are out managing water systems. Yeah, thank you. That's going to be very important. Um, Ruth. Yeah, most of the committee, I mean, we have been focusing on monitoring this national system and in water systems. And I want to just turn for a second to the issue of monitoring the human side, because I think we do have to deal with the uh, diagnostic methods and also the use of the diagnostics, which is not ideal in this country right now. Um, we're not picking up the Legionnaire's disease. Um, we're way underestimating it based on reported cases. And we know that. I also think it's a time to step back and say, let's look at other um, pathogens in water and we need to have a handle on the human disease side. And there is not currently national surveillance for, for example, uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we've talked in the committee about possibly regional centers of excellence where we have academic research strengthening capacity and kind of as a backbone and strengthening the health departments as well. And it gets back to this tying environmental health to the, the human side, the disease side, so. Yeah, thank you. I know we're, our time is up. Mark, I wanna get quickly to you and then I'd like our, our two uh, last panelists, uh, Paul and, and, and we'll end with Michelle. You're, you're coming from different countries, what advice would you give to the US? So let Mark, give us a quick, quick sound bite in terms of yeah. what you think we should do for the national surveillance. And then we'll ask our, our other members to give us advice here in the US. Well, I think there could be a variety of different ways that could be done. You know, EPA could require this uh, under the unregulated monitoring. Uh, utilities could form together and, and do uh, um, um, a monitoring, a voluntary monitoring. So, but I, I come back to the fact is we don't have um, agencies giving out guidance on how to respond. And so, you know, absent that guidance, you know, any detection is a fear. So I think the, 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 the linchpin on this is get, you know, having consensus, whether that's a scientific consensus or regulatory consensus, you know, um, having some kind of um, metric is really important. Yeah, getting back into that yardstick and what number is actionable for which building, when and where. Thanks so much, Mark. Paul, what advice are you going to give us here in the U.S.? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, uh, of course, I'm from a country where there is a national surveillance program on Legionella for uh, almost 20 years now. Um, I think one of the most important points, and that's already been mentioned, so, I mean, the... Priority building owners, we are calling them priority buildings, meaning hospitals, hotels, and uh, buildings like that. They have to monitor for Legionella. Drinking water companies have to monitor the distribution systems for Legionella. They do that very nicely. They report it. And then if there is a problem, they try to solve it. But that also means that there is a lot of data that is just going to the graveyard, you could say and nobody's looking at that anymore. And I think that this data can contain very valuable information to see you know, what kind, how often you see Legionella, is it related to building types, all kinds of things you can get out of it. So I think my major point to the US is if, there, if you will have a, a national surveillance uh, program, make sure that you also do something with the data and not transfer it to a data graveyard, you could say. Yeah, start sharing it and analyzing it. Yes, yes. I'm hearing that loud and cared. Um, Michelle, Provo, I'm gonna give you the last word. Yeah. 
Did we lose Michelle? You're oh, still, still muted, on. Michelle. Oh. <laughs> okay, so coming from Canada in a province in Canada that has uh, regulations for cooling tower and a uh, code that says hot temperature is mandatory, elevated temperatures. I can say that I think in the U.S. you have a unique opportunity with with this uh, this COVID uh, these COVID studies to bring this together and to document what works and doesn't work in terms of control measures in buildings and to, to use common methods. There's already this, this very interesting initiative uh, based on in, uh, in, at Purdue that will tell you, that give you data if we use common methods on, on what, what control measures do work because now a lot of what we've shown in the report are from German, data from Germany or from France or from Italy. I think you need you. US data. It means you need to measure, but you also need to monitor how you bring these numbers down so you have solutions that are tailored to your situation. Thank you so much. Well, um, I want to thank the audience for sticking with us. Um, uh, we're a few minutes over. Um, you can see there's a lot of, uh, I guess, enthusiasm and interest in this area. Um, this really brings together environmental microbiology, public health, and water engineering, um, really to, to focus on our communities and our community health, our sensitive populations. So um, this recording will be available. Uh, all of you that signed up will get an email, um, and it'll be on the National Academy's website um, associated with the webinar. So I hope everyone has a, a, a great, uh, uh, rest of the day and um, uh, happy holidays to come and everyone stay safe, stay, stay, stay safe. <laughs> and thanks panelists, thanks committee members, and thanks to the academies for setting this up.